Committee meeting of the Thursday, 22nd of June, 2017. <clears throat> Can I ask that all mobile phones are either switched off or switched on to flight mode, please? And can I remind everyone present this meeting will be recorded and that the recording will be made sub subsequently made available for public listening, and that applies to today. Members of the public who address the committee during the proceedings today. I'd also like to, at this stage, confirm that all the new members have undergone appropriate training, and I understand they're all perfectly able to uh, determine applications today. And lastly, can I pay tribute to John Martin for the sterling service he made to the committee over his term as chairman? I'm sure I'll be able to emulate that, uh, that good work, John. Lucy, can you confirm the sediment, please? Good morning, everyone. We have 17 members present. We are quoted. And so far, I have apologies from Councillor Ferguson, Councillor Lever, and Councillor Maitland. Councillor Fairbairn is not present, but maybe a little later. Apologies from Councillor Fairbairn. Noted, thank you. Thank you, Lucy. Are there any declarations of interest, members? Jim Combe. Thank you, Chair. Item three, a number of the objectors are known to me. It would be difficult for them not to be given the location of the wind farm. However, the relationship is such that I, do, I don't deem it necessary to withdraw from discussion of item three. However, item four, the applicant is fairly well known to me and I will therefore withdraw for item four. Thank you very much, Jim. Are there any other declarations of interest? I suppose I should declare one at this time that I'm not very good with names, so please forgive me if I call you by the wrong name till we get better acquainted with each other. It's one of my Many failings. <laughs> there is no minute of the previous meeting that was dealt with at, at the full council. Therefore, we'll go on to the procedure. Lucy, can you outline the procedure that we followed today, please? The Planning Applications Committee will consider each application in turn as detailed on the agenda. The case officer or other appointed officer will make a short presentation addressing the determining issues accompanied by digital images. Any late information, amendments or corrections will be reported at this time. Members may ask questions of officers following the presentation on points of clarification. The chairman has been provided with a list of eligible representatives who have registered to speak at this meeting within the period specified in council policy. No other persons will be allowed to speak. The chairman will individually invite those who have registered in advance to speak to make their presentation, after which they may be questioned by committee members. No questions may be asked of members. The order of eligible parties being heard will be as follows. Third parties objecting to an application, third parties supporting an application, statutory consultees objecting to an application, elected members of Dumfries and Galloway Council who are not members of the Planning Applications Committee, such members should withdraw from the committee chamber after making their presentation, applicants or their agents. Representers have been placed in alphabetical order and a copy of the public speaking list is available from the committee officer taking notes of our proceedings. Presentations will be strictly limited to three minutes per person, excepting for national and major developments, which by their very nature are more complex, where the time limit will be five minutes. The chairman of the committee will ask you to come to a conclusion if you take too long. Representers are encouraged to use the time allotted to clarify any points they consider material and address the determining issues. Certain matters are not normally material planning considerations and will not be taken into account by the Council when deciding on a planning application. 
Representors should not raise any new matters without explaining why they were not raised earlier with the case officer. Please do not repeat what is in the report, as members will have already read the report. After all the representations have been heard, the meeting is then in formal session and no members of the public gallery may address the committee from the public gallery. The Planning Applications Committee will then proceed to determine the application or, where appropriate, agree a recommendation to be made to full council who will determine the application. Thanks very much, Lucy. We'll now move on to Agenda Item 3, erection of 14 wind turbines Maximum height of 110 metres to blade tip, one meteorological mast, one telecommunications mast, six temporary meteorological mast, substation control building and temporary construction compound, construction of train hard standings, access tracks and associated infrastructure, NGR 228450 and 557980 at Annabaglish Wind Farm near Glenluce. This is a full application. Recommendation is to refuse, and the case officer is Lindsay Cameron. Lindsay, will you take us through your presentation, please? Thank you, Chair. Uh, just before I move on to the slides, I've got a slight update for members. Um, since the reports went to print, the outstanding response from CIFA as referred to in paragraphs 4.71 and 4.78. Um, of the report has been received. The summary of that response is that, this, uh, is that SEPA maintained their objections to the application on the grounds of the lack of information regarding the water environment, groundwater dependent terrestrial ecosystems, the management of peat and forestry waste. Um, this first slide is a location plan showing the application site, which is located approximately six kilometres to the east of Glenluce and three kilometres southwest of Kirkowen, and stretched as far north as the A75 trunk road. It comprises a semi-raised plateau area of carnivorous <coughs> forestry, moorland, remnant areas of moss and improved pasture. The proposed wind farm, which comprises 14 turbines, is concentrated around a number of pronounced low-domed hills or rocky outcrops. The nearest public road is the A75, located approximately 2.5 kilometres to the north, the U99, which is 1.4 kilometres to the northeast, and the C7W, 1.1 kilometres to the east of the nearest proposed turbines, respectively. The site includes three coniferous plantation areas, as well as open mosses. 14 turbines would all be three-bladed horizontal access turbines of up to 65 metres to hub height and 110 metres to blade tip, with 90-metre diameter rotors and a nominal power output rating of 2 to 2.5 megawatts. The proposal also includes a permanent lattice tower wind monitoring mast of 80 metres in height, as well as six temporary wind monitoring masts also of 80 metres in height and a temporary telecoms mast of 10 metres in height. These are the typical elevations of the control building and substation compound. And this slide shows um, turbine development within 10 kilometres of the application site. There are a number of existing um, and consented wind farms which are shown by the green triangle on the slide, um, as well as um, wind farms which have either been refused, withdrawn or haven't progressed to application stage, which are shown by the red circle. Um, the effect of a number of planning decisions, both in favour and against wind farm development in this area, have in effect consolidated the Wigtonshire Moors cluster, strengthening the association of wind farm development with the more remote moorland landscapes north of the A75. This slide shows the proposed wind farm and those within 10 kilometres in relation to the landscape character type. The Annabaglish turbines would be located within the Mackers unit of the Moss and Forest Lowland landscape character type. And those other existing and consented wind farms are located predominantly within the Wigtonshire Moors, within the Upland Fringe, Plateau Moorland and Plateau Moorland with forest landscape character type. The exception being by Lockhart Moor and its extension located within the Peninsula landscape character type.
This slide shows the uh, development in relation to the landscape character types being almost located entirely within the macros unit of the moss and forest lowland char landscape character type and the southern half of the site within which the turbines would be located lying directly adjacent to the Mochram Loss unit of the Plateau Moorland with Loss landscape character type. The landscape character type in which the uh, wind farm would be located has an overall high medium sensitivity to the large typology and the adjacent Mochram Loss unit has an overall high sensitivity to medium and large typology. It is anticipated that there would be a significant direct landscape effect on the host unit, as well as a significant indirect landscape effect for the character and setting of the adjacent landscape character type. The guidance and development section of the Dupreece and Galloway Wind Farm Landscape Capacity Study indicates that there is limited or no scope to accommodate the large typology within the landscape character type due to the significant landscape and visual effects which would occur. The Mochram Loss Regional Scenic Area, which is shown hatched in blue, lies only 1.3 kilometres south of the proposed development. There would be widespread visibility of the wind farm from much of this designated landscape, with particularly significant adverse impacts occurring from the viewpoints which lie within the Regional Scenic Area. This slide shows relevant constraints in the areas surrounding the site which are referred to in the report and would be adversely impacted by the proposed wind farm. As on the previous slide, the regional scenic area is shown hatched in blue. Archaeologically sensitive areas are outlined and hatched in black, and this includes the area around Knock Fell and the Hill Fort, which is also a scheduled ancient monument. Core paths are shown in purple and include paths to the summit of Knock Fell, and along the northern edge of the regional scenic area. The Macker's yellow cycle route is shown in yellow and National Cycle Route 73 in red. This and the following slide show ZTVs which indicate the proposal would have widespread visibility due to the scale of the turbines, the low-lying nature of the landscape and its proximity to the well-settled lowlands of the Macker's Peninsula. Visibility would be concentrated within around 10 kilometres with views from road settlements, footpaths and cycle routes affected. The development would also be visible in long-range views across Wigton and Loose Bays, but with relatively limited visibility around the Mackers coast. This slide shows turbine development within 35 kilometres, which has been included within the cumulative assessment. The following five, five slides show the cumulative ZTV for Anavaglish together with a number of the other wind farms within 35 kilometres. In each case, the ZTV for Anavaglish is indicated in blue. While cumulative effects uh, with the more distant Wigtonshire Moors wind farm developments are not considered to be significant from the Mackers, including the more sensitive regional scenic area, significant cumulative visual effects would occur in views from the A75 between Newton Stewart and Glenleaf, where the Anavaglish proposal would be seen sequentially and simultaneously with Barlocker extension and Carscrew, which are sited relatively close to this route, and to a lesser degree, Glen Chamber, Gas and Aries, which are more set back. Anna Baglish with Carscrew from the North Rins Wind Farm, followed by Anna Baglish, Barlock Up Moor and its proposed extension. Anna Baglish with Aries and Kilgalia. And Anna Baglish with Gas Wind Farm. The next sequence of slides includes photo montages of the proposed wind farm from representative viewpoints in the surrounding area, together with wire lines showing the cumulative context. The viewpoints included are those from which a significant impact is anticipated. The cumulative wireline drawings demonstrate in the most part that Anna Baglish would either be seen as mu at much greater proximity and distinctly separate from the established cluster in the Wigtonshire Moors and would appear as an isolated development introducing a new feature into the Mackers Peninsula. The first two slides show the, the views from the A75 to the north between Newton Stewart and Glenleaf 
where significant impact and views would be experienced. The first is from the E75 west of Kirkowen, and the second is further west, adjacent to Barnapple Loch, providing the view across Derskelpin Moss. The next two slides show, show viewpoints from the northeast. The first from Fell End to the north of the A75, and the second south of the A75 to the northwest of Kirkowen. The next three slides are from the three viewpoints within the Mokram Lost Regional Scenic Area to the south. There would be widespread visibility of the wind farm from much of this designated landscape, with particularly significant adverse impacts occurring from these three viewpoints. This view also demonstrates the dominance of the proposal in relation to the setting and prominence of Knock Fell, which is the conical hill to just to the, the left of centre of the slide. This is Chalice Lavender and from Mockham Law. This slide shows the view from Mokram Fell across the Mokram Lost Regional Scenic Area, where the proposed wind farm would be seen directly behind the loch and would significantly detract from the perceptions and enjoyment of the designated landscapes. The Council Landscape Architects and SNH conclude that the proposal would have significant adverse effects on the special character, qualities, and setting of the regional scenic area and on the key reasons for its designation. The next two slides. Um, show views from the, the southwest, and again, both the landscape architect and SNH note significant adverse effects on the visual amenity from stretches of roads and recreational routes, including in the Barlockert Moor and Auchan Malg areas. The views from the Mull of Sinanus and Auchan Malg to the southwest also demonstrate the dominance of the proposal in relation to the setting and prominence of Knock Fell. And this final slide shows the view from Knockfell looking in an easterly direction towards the Galloway Hills. Anna McLeish would detract from these views from Knockfell, occupying the foreground in the views to the Galloway Hills, including Cairns Moor Fleet and the intervening lowlands. The increased value of the open, expansive view from Knockfell is recognised following the appeal dismissal and withdrawal, respectively, of the Shenanton and Auckland wind farm proposal. In conclusion, the proposed development would have unacceptable, significant adverse landscape and visual impacts, both in its own and cumulatively, which cannot be satisfactorily, satisfactorily mitigated. The proposals therefore fail to accord with the provisions of the development plan and supplementary guidance, and therefore it is recommended that the application be refused for the reasons set out in the report. Thanks very much, Lindsay. Any questions for the case officer at this moment in time? No. In that case, there are no objectors listed to address the committee. So we will go to the <coughs> the applicant, Heather Donald, if you'd like to come forward, please, Heather. And when you start to address the committee, we will time your presentation. We'd expect you to finish within five minutes, please. Just whenever you're ready. And I'll, I'll give you an indication of 30 seconds to go just just in case you need a prompt to, to drop in time. Okay, good morning, members. Um, thanks very much for the opportunity to speak to you today. Um, I'm going to tell you a little bit about RES um, and our commitment to local businesses in the region Galloway. And uh, I'll give you a couple of examples of other wind farms that we've constructed in the area um, by way of example. Um, and also, I would like to read out a statement from Ardwell Estates, who are the landowner at Anna Begleish, who were unable to attend today. So RES is the UK's largest independent renewable energy developer, with interest in wind, solar and energy storage. We're a wholly owned UK company at the forefront of innovation and design around the world, and we now employ over 1,400 people. Since developing our first onshore wind farm in Scotland in the early 90s, RES has developed and or constructed 16 onshore wind farms with a total installed capacity in excess of 300 megawatts. We employ approximately 80 people in Scotland, and this includes one of our wind farm site managers, James Smith, who lives near Castle Douglas. 
So before talking specifically about Anne of Gleish, I'd just like to remind members that onshore wind is now the cheapest form of new electricity generation. That's bar none. So thus making any new onshore wind farms not only beneficial for the environment and local businesses, but also for bill payers. Res firmly believes that whenever possible, local contractors and employees should be used in all aspects of wind farms development, construction and operation. At Annabelle Gleish, we've estimated that £3.9 million will be spent in the local economy during construction and first year of operation. And you don't need to trust our words on this because you can judge us against the opportunities that we've already created for businesses and industries in Galloway. Over the past two years, we've successfully constructed two onshore wind farms locally. So Glen Chamber Wind Farm near Glen Luce and Minigap Wind Farm near Beatit. Throughout the construction of both projects, RES has used a number of high quality contractors, services, materials and accommodation providers from right across the region. And to demonstrate that, I'll just give you a couple of brief examples. So firstly, at Glen Chamber Wind Farm, we became aware of uh, Loose Bay, based near, near Dunraget, through our early procurement work. Um, their business has grown substantially over the last 42 years, allowing them to provide one-stop solutions for a range of construction and utilities projects, both large and small. Despite this experience, they'd never acted as a main civil contractor of, for an onshore wind project. However, being located only eight miles from the wind farm, Rez worked closely with them and they were ultimately successful with their tender. Their appointment gave employment to 45 local people during an 18-month construction period. Additionally, they subcontracted a lot of the minor work to other local companies that they knew and had pre-existing relationships with, thereby helping to support local businesses within the supply chain. Importantly, though, it's given them the invaluable knowledge and expertise to allow them to bid for more onshore wind projects in the future, of which we hope Anna Bugleish would be one. In 2015, Rez also started constructing our Minigat wind farm. Uh, Rez appointed local farm Grange Quarry to take on a range of essential activities. The work supported the employment of six staff that live and work in the local community for a period of 12 months. The ultimate result of Rez working with these local companies resulted in us investing more than £10 million. So that's more than £10 million into the increasing Galloway economy over a period of two years. So I, I would therefore urge you members to fully consider the significant net economic benefits to Anna Bugleish when coming to a decision today. So unfortunately, Ardwell Estates, our, our landowners, were unable to make the committee today. Um, but in their absence, they've asked us to read out the statement below. Ardwell Estates is a family-owned local company with 20 farms and 40 cottages for rent at Nokashi near Kirkowen and at Ardwell in the Rins. It's committed to providing opportunities for tenant farmers in what's a rapidly contracting sector and for providing affordable quality homes for local families and individuals who are often in low income or receiving benefits. The company does not pay a dividend to its shareholders and any profit is invested to meet increasing legal commitments to improve fixed equipment and farming and continually upgrade its homes for the benefit of local people. Income from the proposed wind farm would be reinvested by Ardwell Estates. A guaranteed funding stream such as this would undoubtedly transform the estate's ability to progress its modernisation programme. The estate has a strong ethical and community policy and always seeks to spend its money locally. As well as its own employees, the estate supports many local businesses and charities and has established an excellent reputation for buying local supplies and using the skills of local tradesmen. So members, in conclusion, I urge you to support this application. Support the application for Dumfries and Galley businesses like Lewis Bay and Grange Quarry who are seeking to grow and expand. Support the application for your constituents and their families who rely on work in the construction industry. Support the application for continued investment in Ardwell Estate and near tenants' homes. And support the application and back the cheapest form of new electricity generation. Thank you. Thanks very much, Heather. That was bang on. Thank you very much indeed. Do any members have any questions for the applicant, Archie? Thanks very much, Heather. I mean, you've addressed the economic side of things, which is fine, but the refusal is on the, the impact it actually has within the area, and you've never mentioned anything on that. Or at least that, I've never heard anything you say, say about that. Can you give us an idea of why, you know, members should uh, overturn the recommendation of, of officers on the reasons why they are suggesting refusal? I understand the economic argument. I've not heard anything that makes me change my mind as yet on the reason for refusal. Yep, there, there are there are four main points um, in my mind about in terms of the planning argument and which tip the planning balance effectively um, in favour of supporting the application. Um, we've heard about um, localised landscape visual effects from the project, um, and it's impossible to construct a wind farm without significant effects. But in this case. They're confined to a seven-kilometre radius around the wind farm. 
Um, and even within this area, um, there would be locations where the wind farm would be screened. Um, from the A75, um, there are actually limited views due to the setbacks in the road and the intervening topography and forestry. Um, uh, two other key points I would make are the access to the site um, is from the A75. So it therefore limits the impact on local communities of using rural roads. Um, and the other, the other thing to note is the habitat management proposals that are included in the application. So um, these include the creation of the peat bog habitat and compensatory replanting on, on site with native trees to suit the wet ground conditions and improve biodiversity in the area. Um, the, the other points to note are that SNH and, and Historic Scotland have not, have not firmly objected to the application. Thanks, Heather. Happy with that. Hey, Jim McComb. Thanks, Chair. Heather, the construction jobs are extremely welcome, but they are of a temporary nature. My question is, how many permanent jobs were created at Glen Charma? Yeah, I mean, we, uh, we accept that the, a lot of the jobs that are created are during the construction process and in the lead up to the construction process, so during development phases, um, you know, in terms of investment and um, the money is, is invested through, you know, accommodation providers and things in the local area. Um, in the longer term, um, you know, it's difficult to say exactly how many full-time jobs are created for the life of the wind farm, um, despite its very nature, but I, given the sort of expertise now in this area, um, with the continued development of Bombshore Wind, given the, the, the government's ongoing commitment to that, um, you know, there's, there, um, there are you know, ongoing opportunities, employment opportunities for local people. Any other member, any questions for the applicant? Elaine? <clears throat> Thank you, Chair. Um, the site seems a strange, slightly inappropriate site for a wind farm. I just wondered why RES had actually selected this site to develop? Yeah, we, we have a, a, a GIS um, system that we use um, where we identify sites um, based on a whole series of constraints. So we look at um, you know, nationally designated areas, we look at local designations, we look at topography, terrain, peatland, access, um, land ownership. We look at all these factors. Um, and this is a site identified by our GIS system a, a number of years ago now, um, which, which provides um, excellent access, has a willing landowner. We've been able to avoid um, or, or mitigate many of the impacts. Um, originally, this scheme was, was a much larger scheme, which involved taller turbines. It was scaled back dramatically um, during the site design process, and we, we moved it further south, away from the A75, to minimize impacts. Um, and we have avoided, um, you know, impacts on the sort of um, nationally important um, areas, which it, uh, um, has resulted in, in no objection from SNH. Thanks, Elaine. John Martin. Just to keep hearing about the SNH, I've not put an objection. They've not put an objection, but they've raised serious concerns on the 25th of February 2014, and they were updated again on the 1st of February 2017. So it's very unusual for natural heritages to put an objection in, but for to raise serious concerns, to me that's just much the same as an objection. Oh, that would have, I thought that would have been better in session, but never mind. Uh, are there any more questions for Heather? In that case, we will resume your seat. Thanks very much, Heather. Thank Members you. now in session. Archie? No, thanks very much, Heather. It was the point that John made that I was going to come back with with regards, you know, the reasons for perhaps overturn this. I haven't heard anything that, that would change my mind from the officer's recommendation. So therefore, I'd I, 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 you know, propose that we go with the recommendations in this particular report based on the information that we have within the report. Sure. Any Ivor? Chair, I would second Councillor Driver. It's quite clear that none of the points within the recommendations were addressed from either the report or from the representative today, so I would say no problem. Thanks very much for that, Ivor. Are there any alternative proposals from members? 
that case it's a unanimous decision. Can you confirm the decision of the committee, please, Lucy? And the committee have decided to refuse the application as per the officer's recommendations. Thank you. If we come to agenda item four, application for planning permission for erection of dwelling house and installation of septic tank and soak away at plot one, Kirkland, Minigarth, Newton Stewart. That's the full application. The recommendation is to refuse, and the case officer is Billy Murray. Billy, will you take us through your presentation when you're ready, please? Yes, thank you, Chair. As you say, this is an application, a full planning application for the erection of a dwelling house at Plot 1, Kirkland, Mini <coughs> Gaff. I'll take you through the slides and images of the site. This is a location plan showing the site. Uh, you'll note it's at the northern end of Newton Stewart. It lies just out with the settlement boundary. This is a closer view of the northern part of, well, Newton Stewart as a whole, but that part would be Mini Gaff on the eastern side of the Penkiln Burn. Uh, the, the, the thick black line is the defined settlement boundary in the local development plan. Uh, the site lies on the western side of the Penkiln Burn at that location. Uh, this is an aerial view of the site. Again, it's the same as the previous slide, uh, but just an aerial view to give an impression of uh, the, the northern part of the town uh, and the juxtaposition of the site with that part of the town. These are views of the site itself. Uh, I have to say in advance that it's quite difficult to get representative views of this site because it's very overgrown and because of topography and, and uh, the proximity of the burn, it's quite difficult to get good images, but I've done my best. Uh, this is a view of the proposed access from the UTIC 268W, uh, and that's taken from the south. The site's on the right in that view, so the proposed access would be formed where that existing passing place is. Uh, this is the same uh, location, but viewed in the opposite direction. That's taken from the north. So in this view, the site's on the left. Uh, this is a closer view into the site from the same location. This is the southern part of the site. And these are just views taken round from where I'm standing in that lay-by. That's looking generally east um, into the site from the proposed access point. Uh, and this is looking more in a northerly direction from the proposed access point. Uh, these are some images within the site um, from just where the access would be taken. Again, that's looking generally south. Um, and that's looking generally northeast. Uh, and this is looking north within the site. The access road's on the left in that view. Uh, the site's on your right. Uh, just some general views within the application site to give members an impression of the characteristics of the site. Um, this is the proposed access point looking uh, south uh, on the access road. So that's just to show the, the character of the, act, the public access road as it approaches the site. Um, and again, this is further back looking towards the, from the proposed access point looking north. Uh, the property see on the left is Kirkland Farmhouse. Uh, the public road terminates just approximately at the end of that. Uh, view, there's a turning head there, but that's the end of the public road. Um, these are a couple of views of Queen Mary's Bridge, which is mentioned in the report. This is a view of Queen Mary's Bridge from the west side. Uh, the property you see in, on the far side there is Walk Mill, which is also mentioned in the report at some stages. This is a similar view of the bridge from the eastern side. Uh, the northern point of the site uh, comes right up to Queen Mary's Bridge which is partially why I'm taking images from there. So this is a view looking downstream from Queen Mary's Bridge. That was taken in November 2016, so there was less tree cover. That's just to give an impression of the characteristics of the burn uh, just south of Queen Mary's Bridge. The sites on your, the northern part of the sites on your right in that view, uh, and members will note uh, the very steep rocky banks and the narrow nature of the burn there because Ground levels on the site rise significantly towards the north, uh, so the, the, the river banks are much more steep uh, in the northern part. Uh, this is a view taken uh, in the summer from the same point, um, just again giving an indication of 
the amount of tree cover and what views would be like from Queen Mary's Bridge. Um, the site's on your right in that view. Um, this is taken from the other side of the Penkiln Birds burn. Uh, so this is from the town side of the burn, um, looking towards the site. The site's on the far side of the burn in that view. Um, this is the same view again, taken in the summer, to give an impression of what it would be like when there, was, when there were leaves on the trees. I've taken a number of views uh, within the site on the riverbanks just to give an indication of the characteristics of the site and its boundary to the river. So this is the eastern site boundary, uh, in other words, the riverbank, and that's looking north. And that's from the same point looking south. The site's on your right in that view. That's just a general view within the southern part of the site. Similarly, within the southern part of the site, looking south. This is at the, the southern part of the site, a view looking north, showing the, the, the shallower riverbanks there than there are just below the bridge. Um, this is the lower lying southern part of the site. Again, that's the eastern part of the site boundary, and that's looking south from the same point. And again, these are general views within the site, the southern part of the site, apologies. So this is uh, the southern part of the site looking towards Beckfoot, which is an adjacent residential property uh, that's referred to in the report. Um, you can see an outbuilding in connection with Beckfoot in that view. That's again within the site looking south towards Beckfoot. Um, these are just a couple of views of the actual public access road to the site. Uh, so that's the approach to the site on the U268W, which is single track with passing places. The first of the passing places is on, is on the left in that view. Um, this is further along towards the site. Um, the site would be in the, the, the far distance in that view. Uh, the clipped hedge you see on the right there is the boundary of the residential property at Beckfoot. So, uh, Members will note from the report that the key consideration uh, in terms of this application is whether or not uh, the proposal complies with housing in the countryside policy under H3, uh, and in particular, um, whether the group of buildings uh, at and around Kirkland can be considered as a small building group for the purposes of that policy uh, and the associated supplementary guidance. So these are views just showing the houses um, that were considered in our officer's assessment of whether or not it met the terms of the supplementary guidance and policy. So the, the three houses referred to are Beckfoot, which is shown in blue at the bottom of the three in blue, uh, Kirtland Farmhouse, which is the central one in blue, uh, and the converted part of the steading at Kirtland Farm, which is the, the, the northern one shown in blue. Uh, references also made in the assessment and indeed in supporting submissions to two other properties that are more distant. These are shown in green uh, at Gilbray and Ardnagill. Um, this is just an uh, un un annotated view, as the same as the previous slide, just showing where the properties are. Um, this is a, a, a slide to try and illustrate uh, one of the, 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 the criteria in the small building group assessment, which is whether the houses can be viewed as a group in the landscape. Um, so I used an aerial view there to try and give an impression of whether you could view the whole uh, group in the landscape as a group. Um, it's difficult to demonstrate that with an aerial view also, but because of topography and tree cover, there's very few public uh, views from which you would see uh, all the buildings as a coherent group in any sense. That's a similar, well, it's the same view, but un un annotated again. These are the drawings submitted with the application. So these are the proposed sections of the building. This is a block plan with topographical information. Uh, and these are site sections. Apologies, we appear to have missed the elevations. It's jumping slightly. Sorry. So these are the proposed plans and elevations of, of the house. 
site sections, which you've seen, block plan with topographical information, which you've seen, um, site sections, which we've covered. So in conclusion, uh, as I mentioned uh, when going through the slides, the key policy consideration here is whether the, the, the proposal accords with policy H3, and in particular, whether the group of buildings can be considered as a small building group. A detail of that assessment is contained in paragraphs 46 to 410 of the report. Uh, the conclusion reached is that uh, the group of buildings does not meet the criteria as a small building group. Uh, so the recommendation is to refuse the application for the reasons stated in the report. Thanks very much, Billy. Do any members have any questions for the case officer, Councillor McKee? Just uh, can you give us an idea of measurements from the uh, river up to the top of the land closest to the river bank? What heights, what heights the bank? <coughs> <coughs> To be honest, I don't have that figure, an accurate figure in my mind, which is why I used, tried to use slides to show you. Clearly, the southern part of the site is much lower. You know, it would be speculation on my part, uh, if not guesswork. I mean, I, that information is contained on uh, the, the drawing that was submitted with the flood risk assessment uh, and the topographical levels. But um, apologies, I, I don't actually have an accurate figure for that. You know, it's a metre to two metres, but I'm speculating. I, would, I wouldn't want to rely on that. Thanks, Joe. Any other members for the case officer? Dougie. Um, thanks, Chair. Just to clarify for me, please, why the dwellings on Camlodon Road and Bower Drive are not considered part of the, the group of houses that you've already highlighted on the slides? because they are within the settlement boundary. The, the key policy consideration is, uh, b because the, the application site is out with the settlement boundary, albeit up against it, um, it needs to be considered under housing in the countryside policy. The houses that you refer to are actually within the settlement boundary, so they are part of the settlement as existing. Consequently, they cannot be considered as an element of a small building group under the housing in the countryside policy. Thanks, Dougie. Any other members for the case officer? Ivor? It's with regard to the planning history for Beckfoot. What reasons were given by the committee to actually overturn the officer's recommendation? And what policy was it against when it was first up? Because was it the Hamlet's policy at that time or something like that, which was then considered as part of a Hamlet or... Uh, was it something else? I knew you were going to ask me that question. I have to admit it has proved impossible to find a minute of that committee. I, I was unable to find a minute of that committee to establish what reasons were given by the committee um, for overturning the officer's recommendation. In terms of the second part of your question, uh, they were effectively equivalent policies then to the ones we had now. It was housing in the countryside policy, uh, and there was reference, as you say, to hamlets. Uh, and the conclusion of officers was that it was not a hamlet at that time. Um, but again, I have to apologise. I, I was unable to find the appropriate minute. Thanks, Iva. Any other questions for the case officer? In that case, we have no objectors to this application. We have Gavin Marr, the applicant. This is a local application, so you will be allowed three minutes, Gavin, and I will remind you with 30 seconds to go just to bring your presentation to a conclusion. And again, just, just when you're ready. Good morning, Chairman, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Many thanks for allowing me the time to present my case today. Uh, I'm here to ask you to, to overturn uh, Mr. Murray's decision uh, to refuse recommendation based on policy H3, um, the housing in the countryside uh, criteria. Um, and I would ask you to uphold the dis original decision made some 25, 27 years ago by your predecessors in a committee. 
Nothing has changed since that time other than the committee uh, passed uh, permission for two houses, uh, obviously envisaging that two houses would be built. One was built, successfully built, and has nestled in well to the area. So for me, nothing has changed on, uh, but for the fact that the second house hasn't been built, and I'm here today to ask you to, to um, allow permission for that house to to be built and for the Kirkland development uh, to be complete. Um, I've only got three minutes, so I'll, I'll touch on uh, the, the point around policy H3, which it comes under, um, uh, which is, what is, is why it's been um, uh, rec recommended refusal by, by Mr. Murray. Key, key areas are the plot is surrounded by three separate habitable and occupied houses in close proximity, uh, as described by Mr. Murray. The development can be viewed, again, in the report from both the wider landscape and the Queen Mary's Bridge, so it can be viewed as a group. Walkmill and Walkmill House have been included when considering the historical ambience as they are grade two buildings, but they've not been included when considering the, the location and the sense of place, and I think they should. By your predecessors, outline planning permission was granted at the same time at the same meeting in February 1990 for two houses. The committee at that time would clearly envisage um, a group which, where two houses were getting built. One was successfully built, the other due to the the, the, the individual's personal circumstances didn't get built. You have 30 seconds to go. Oh. Beck, um, three minutes, is it? Um, plot one is currently an eyesore. It's described by the planning office as unkempt and overgrown, which you've seen from the photographs. Building here would enhance the wildlife and the environment. There are very much naturally established boundaries with houses round about it. There is a dike, a bridge, a water course, and a burn. Um, Can you it, just draw it to a conclusion, Gavin? Please? It is infill and not ribbon, uh, and it's clearly part of a recognisable group. I appreciate your support, uh, uh, as I feel strongly that it meets its three criteria. Um, and thanks. Thank you very much, Gavin. Thanks for the presentation. Do any members have any questions for the applicant? Archer? Mr. Mark, can you just tell me, I mean, obviously there's been a, 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 you know, application has been granted before, um, and, and, and did I hear you say there was one house actually being built on that? Uh, there, there wasn't the second one. Can you give us any reason why the second one wasn't built under that? The second one wasn't built due to the, the family at that time's personal circumstances. There, there was a, an elderly parent was to move in with, with the couple who subsequently passed away, and the development and the circumstances were that they didn't decided to change their minds because that was a key driver in, in them uh, moving to the area from Ayrshire at that time. Thanks, Archer. David. Thank you, Chair. Uh, Mr. Marr, you, you mentioned that there might be a positive um, contribution to wildlife by the realisation of this house. Could you elaborate? Next door in Beckford. Mr. Coy uh, has developed his house and garden and has many, many species of all the, the, the various uh, birds and animals that, that, that now go onto his land with bird boxes and various other things. And he's planted something like 20 different species of trees within that. So he's enhanced that area. The plot, as you would see, that I'm looking for permission on is next door is a complete mess. Uh, the topsoil has been taken away by a previous owner. Um, the dikes are all falling down, and there's just no natural habitat there at all. So next door is is there's, there's a hell of a lot more, and and that has proved that it can be developed in, in a in a favourable way for the environment and habitat. Thanks, David. Do you want to come back, no. Elaine? Elaine. It's a different point. You <clears throat> referred to Beckfoot as being next door, uh, Mr. Marr. Um, 
How far is Beckfoot from the proposal where you would propose to, to build the new uh, house? About, sort of, uh, about 30, 40 metres from the build. And it's the, it's the adjacent side. Let the crawlers up there. That's, that's it on the, in the, the blue one in the bottom, the bottom left. So it's about 20 or 30 metres to the boundary, and then the house is about another 20 metres beyond that. So about 50 or 60 metres between the houses. Thanks, Elaine. Any other questions for the applicant? Katie? Um, hi there, yes. I was just wondering, in terms of the neighbours within the settlement, do they consider themselves, have you been in, have you been in touch with them and have they considered themselves to be a small development of buildings or do they consider themselves individual landowners? No, I've been in touch with them. There's, there's two of the immediate neighbours are very much in support of this and, and you can see that from your your documentation. There's only one immediate neighbour that objected, and there's no one came, came here today to, to further object, but there's only one of the eight people uh, that objected that stays next to it, one individual. Uh, and so, um, and all those concerns raised there have been uh, dealt with. So the, 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 the immediate neighbours uh, and especially Mr. Coy at the house adjacent is, is very supportive of this. Thanks, Katie. Can you I, want to come back? Now? Yep. Can I just come back, though, to the point is, do they feel that they're a group of buildings together? Is there a sort of small community within the neighbourhood yes, of these is. houses? <clears throat> yes, they usually have a, a sort of get-together two or three times a year for a drink and things like that. <laughs> but, in, but in your main point, they, they're, they're, there is a... There is a close community. There's, 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 the neighbours do do catch up and mix socially and, and so forth, and, and they have a, a good understanding. Right from the, the, the mouth of the road, which is uh, Ardnagill, and right down to, to Kirkland, and even the, the walk mill, which is just slightly over the bridge. Thanks, Katie. John Young. Hey, thank you, Chair. One of the objections spoke about the flood risks, and one of your supporters also commented on the floods, the, the, the lack of evidence for, a, for it being a flood risk. Could we have your opinion on the situation regarding flooding, please? Well, I, I'm a local chap with a local family and have lived in that vicinity for 25 years, and uh, I'm very familiar with the flood. So, personal experience having passed it fairly regularly over those years is that it's never flooded. Um, the flood risk assessment that uh, I had was commissioned that I had to get done confirmed that, that there's no issues. Um, we've raised the base of the house just, just in line with uh, the flood risk assessment report to 22 metres, which is 2.4 metres higher than Beckfoot, which is built uh, in the site adjacent. Um, to, to that, so it's it's pretty high. So there's, you know, I wouldn't, personally speaking, I wouldn't be considering investing fairly heavily in building a nice house if I thought for one minute that there was an issue around flooding. So I'm th through through the, the 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 commission flood report and personal experience and the experience of others living there, uh, I'm confident that there's no issues at all with, with flooding. Thanks, John. Any other questions for the? David. Thank you once again. Uh, Mr. Mar, the building um, is quite close to uh, Walk Mill, which uh, looked very nice. We didn't see um, the, the other house, the Beck, Beck Hall, I've forgotten its name. Beckfoot. Yeah. Beckfoot. Um, but may I ask um, what sort of um, external cladding or colours are you going to use? How's it going to fit into the. Uh, well, exactly. It'll be, it'll be <coughs> um, slate, grey slate roof, wooden. Wooden windows. All uh, Mr. Murray has confirmed in his report that he's happy with the, the design for housing in the country, and it'll be an, extent, uh, an external render of a of a, of a grey type colour, silver grey type colour, to blend in with both Beckfoot and the farmhouse. So, you know, I'm very much conscious that that it's a infill. And it is a link between the house that's been already built at Beckfoot and the farmhouse. 
and it just finishes off nicely, and it and it and the the type of house blends in nicely with what what's there already. Thank you. Any other members have any further questions for the applicant? In that case, Mr. Murray, you'd like to take your seat again, please. Thank you very much for your presentation. Thank you. Members are now in session. Up, Chair. And then you. Well, thanks very much, Chair. I mean, the, 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 the point on this one for me goes to page 56 at 4.23 to 4.25. Uh, and although, you know, originally there was planning approved in this, we have to look at the other material considerations that have been given uh, in, 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 in this particular case. There has been change in policy for 25 years ago. We all know that. We've all been part of it. We've been part of the consultation. Um, and, and whether, you know, we, we like it or not, if, if, if the, the groundwork had been started, then there would be no need for another application coming forward because that would be in perpetuity. But there's been no work started. There's been new policies put in place. The Scottish planning policy offers general support in favour of sustainable development with the aim of being achieved the right development in the right place, but not to allow development at any cost. Unfortunately, this is 24 years on, um, and, and we know where we've been in the past in some of the applications that went forward in Wigton when the Wigton Area Committee actually went uh, and approved applications that maybe officers didn't recognise as going forward. I, I've had a look at this, this report, and, and, and although I would like to support the, the, the thing, I, I can't, you know, looking at policy, uh, I can't see any other uh, reason for actually um, going against the officer's recommendation to refuse, and I would so move, Chair. So you're moving, they agree the officer's recommendation, okay, Ian? Thanks, Chairman. Uh, slightly different view for Archie, certainly at this moment in time, but taking on the points that I think, listening to everybody, uh, the, uh, the, the points that have been raised around the room, uh, topographic, topographical levels was, was raised, but I think that's potentially been addressed in regards to this, at least uh, compared to what's existing being built fairly, with a previous application, there's eight feet above the fence floor, floor level is actually eight foot higher with this proposal compared to the one previously. So it almost puts Councillor McKee's question to bed to, to, to a degree, but there's a lot of planning history. Uh, there's some refusal, but refusal, but predominantly approvals in this actual uh, uh, site. Uh, there is enhancements being mentioned, uh, both, uh, I think, to the local wildlife, so on and so forth. But the actual unkempt look of the site itself, there is potential uh, enhancements there. Uh, when you look at the site plan, the overall plan, just the site plan and the location plan, the, the wider, the one in 2500 or whatever it may be, it's, uh, it, when you look at it, you think, oh, well, that's actually part of Newton Stewart. It does, because you've got, you've got two roads that loop down, but you've got this burn in between. It's not obvious in the plan that we see there, but you've got two roads. You think, oh, well, it does actually look as if it's within the settlement boundary. When you see the plan, there's a clear line delegating the, 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 the actual uh, this, this settlement boundary. But, I mean, in real terms, it's, as the case officer himself has said, the photographs that are presented, it's difficult to actually make out what's what, you, to get a real feel and understanding of what's there. And I'd be keen, rather than just putting this one to bed at the moment, I'd be keen to have a site visit. How does it relate to Newton Stewart? How does it relate to the, the previous uh, the plan history, the, 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 what's been built there previously? I think to really get a grasp of this, and come back to, and ideally we'll get a chance to get Ivor's question answered in regards to ERA Committee at that point in time. It's a number of years ago now, but and, and carrying on through, I've looked at this and thought, actually, we consider this to be a, uh, a, a, an application that they could support. It would it'd be good to have an understanding of why they've actually supported it, that decision at the time. So, I mean, I, I'd like to, to have a site visit, Chairman. Certainly would propose that, just in order to, to get together that, that particular piece of information that I've just outlined. Thank you, Chairman. Okay, in that case, debate stops unless uh, a decision is taken not to pursue a site visit. So, we have a request for a site visit. Does anyone, is anyone prepared to second that proposal? David, you are. Are there any alternative proposals? David McKee? I would, I would move that we decide this application today, Chair. Are there any seconders for that proposal? I ah, second that. Okay, in that case, before we progress, we need to determine whether or not we have a site visit. So, Lucy, can you take us through the process, please? Okay, we'll have to take this matter now to a vote. 
Okay, we have a motion put forward by Councillor Crothers and seconded by Councillor James um, to that refer this matter for a site visit. An amendment proposed by Councillor McKee and seconded by Councillor Drybrat to determine the application today. Councillor Dempster. Amendment. Councillor Campbell. Amendment. Ron Campbell. John Campbell. As Vice Chair first. Amendment. Councillor Blake. Motion. Councillor Dickey Campbell. Amendment. Councillor Crothers. Motion. Councillor Drybra. Amendment. Councillor Gilroy. Councillor Juicy. Motion. Councillor Hagman. Amendment. Councillor Hislop. Councillor James. Motion. Councillor Martin. Amendment. Councillor McComb. No, no. Councillor McKee. Amendment. Councillor Murray. Amendment. Councillor Tate. Councillor Young. Amendment. And I can confirm that the amendment carries and therefore their application will be determined today. So we'll proceed with the with, with the business. I have two indicated speakers. I have Ivor uh, Archie, your motion, original motion will still stand. Uh, Ivor and then Katie. Chair, in one of the pictures that was up, we had the view of the entrance, which is a, a passing place. And there is, it looks like breeze block work done. Is that actually the start of work being undertaken on the site? As in one of uh, one area in my, that was taken out of my ward, we had a Tesco store which put in a curb stone, and that was considered starting the work, which meant that the application site and the planning permission was there in perpetuity. And I think there's a is it at the back of that there's a sort of breeze block uh, wall? Is that part of the site being started and therefore the actual application would be started and would be there in perpetuity? If Bill isn't able to answer that, no. I'll ask David. Um, that passing place was formed in connection with planning permission for conversion of the steading building at Kirkland Farm Steading, which is on the right in that view. Um, the original uh, conditions attached to that permission required passing places to be formed. The originally agreed location for the passing place in that location was on the right in that view, uh, which is the garden ground of Kirtland Farmhouse, and you can see that the level is significantly higher uh, than the public road at that location. What then happened was that the then applicant, and well, still owns Kirtland Farm, um, chose to request that the passing place be relocated to the other side of the road to avoid having to excavate into his garden. So he obtained the permission of the then owner of the site um, simply to uh, form that passing place. And because of the change in levels, it needed uh, the block work you see as retaining. So the simple answer is no, those works have no connection with the previously approved development for a dwelling house on this site. They're entirely in connection with the application and approval for holiday accommodation at Kirkland Farm. Thanks, Billy. Katie? Thank you, Chair. Um, looking at the recommended decision, it says that there's no, no suitable small building group exists at this locality, and that's the reason for refusal. Am I correct? Yep. So looking also at the report in 4.5, Policy H3 supports proposal for new housing and development in the countryside where one or more of the six criteria are met. Now, the first part of that criteria is 
has written here that it is defined as three or more separate habitable or occupied houses which are well related to each other and which create a sense of place. I'm just wondering, in terms of Beck Foot, is that included as one of the habitable dwellings? Because you've got Kirkland, Walkmill and Beck Foot, so that's three habitable, is that correct? I just wanted clarification on what, what buildings you've included in that, because the, the policy states it's defined as three or more separate habitable, and having heard from the applicant, who has confirmed that there is a sense of community there, I just wanted to confirm the numbers of buildings, please. With all, with all due respect, the applicant has given an opinion. Um, yeah, fair enough. First of all, the, the detailed assessment of the small building groups issue, as I said earlier, is contained in paragraphs 46 to 410 of the report. So that is covered in detail. Uh, if you look at the slides I've brought up again, um, the three blue houses are the, the ones that are considered in that assessment in the paragraphs I've just referred to. The bottom one is Beckfoot. Uh, the central blue one is Kirkland Farmhouse. And the northern blue one is partial steading conversion at Kirkland to form a dwelling house. The, these are the three properties that are considered in the detailed assessment of the small building group. Um, the conclusion was that Gill Bray and Ardna Gill could not be considered in that because of separation distance, uh, and they just in no way could be seen as part of a coherent grouping of buildings there. In terms of the other buildings that are mentioned and were mentioned in supporting submissions, Walk Mill and Walk Mill House, I don't have them highlighted there because as you'll see from the report, and as I confirmed earlier to another member, they were not considered because they are within the settlement boundary. So therefore they can't effectively be considered as part of a small building group in the countryside. Katie, John Young. Thank you, Chair. Could Mr Murray please in indicate where in that shaded area the property would actually be located? I thought I was loud enough. <laughs> I have been told that in the past. I was just trying to see if there was something that showed it better. Perhaps if I go to the, the applicant's plans. Well, that shows the house position in the wider part of the site. Um, the, the site boundary to the south would be the, the dark line that you see running in the bottom left-hand corner of that view. The property at Beckfoot runs from there. So the, to the right of that line is the garden ground at Beckfoot. I like that, John. Okay. So far, we have a. Okay, Lane. Aye, Lane Murray. <clears throat> Thank you, Chair. Um, I just wanted to probe a little bit more about the idea of a sense of place, because obviously, a sense of place is different from a sense of community. A, you know, a disparate group of houses can have a sense of community because people are part of the same groupings and so on, and and, and have a, an identity. To me, from the slides that you were showing, I didn't see much in the way of connection, a physical connection between the properties round about. They seemed to be very disparate properties. I didn't see any particular connection about that. But is, is that what is intended by the, the description of a, of a sense of place? Yes, I think you're right. Uh, sense of place is a, is a, as a concept is difficult to, to define in any firm way in terms of if it meets this criteria, it's got a sense of place. If it doesn't, it hasn't. When you read the, the, the written literature on sense of place, it talks about it's something that you'll recognize if you see it and feel it, but you can't really define what it is. And it also often refers to the fact that for somewhere to have a sense of place, it's something that someone would feel who wasn't of that area. So a visitor going there would 
immediately have the impression um, that this was a group building and there was a reason for them being there. And as you mentioned, they, they show a clear in, interconnection and there's some kind of coherent sense of it being a group. So it, it, it's a difficult one to pin down in terms of a report. Um, but having considered it against all the written literature I could find on sense of place, as you'll see from the report, the conclusion was that there wasn't a sense of place there. Thanks, Billy. I'll get David just to add a wee bit for your benefit, Elaine. Uh, it is really something that you would look for a clear identity so that, for example, some of the, in the area that I used to cover over Nandale and Estelle, somewhere like Rig or Holly is a small building group. You would go to Holly, you would understand when you reached Holly. It's a, a clear cluster of buildings that have an identity. I think here the point Billy is making is that they're, they are disparate. There's no nucleus around it. There are a number of buildings which historically have evolved over time rather than you would, well, would you say you were going to Kirkland? Is Kirkland an entity that people in uh, Newton Stewart would recognize? I have two further speakers, and hopefully we'll, 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 we'll can progress. I've got, oh, I've actually got three. I've got David McKee, Ian Carruthers, and Ian Blake. Uh, thanks, Chair. I think uh, early on somebody suggested I was talking about building a floodplain, but does raising the height of the house floor justify building in a, in a floodplain? I would have had doubts about that. Anyway, I think uh, there's appropriate wording at the top of page 53. There is a scattering of three houses, and I think that is very appropriate. That's the impression I get. And the other issue I would have, if we give permission to build this house, would the owner be able to clear that whole site of the trees? Because there, there's, if you leave the trees in place, you've got a remoteness because you're surrounded by the trees. But if you, you clear the trees away, you're having a fair effect on the, the vision on the, the community around about. I know up where I stay, a, tree, a, a number of trees were felled that I would have said were inappropriate, but that, that's beside the point. Um, is there any way the trees could be protected or that site, the rest of that site could be protected? I'll get David to deal with that because currently it's a TPO is the only way you can protect a tree. David. Yes, that's exactly it. Uh, Billy, could you go back to the block plan to show context? Because what you can see quite clearly from that plan is just how much of the, the site would be covered by a house, garden, car parking access and turning. So there would be scope for some trees to be protected you could put a tree preservation order on them, or in theory, you could use a condition that's not as strong as a TPO. But the only safe distance is falling distance. So looking at the, the height of some of the trees in Billy's photos there, I would have concerns about the, the effect on the house of having those trees there, because don't forget the root structure of a tree is pretty much the same as what you see above ground. So any disturbance to the roots would have an effect on the stability of the tree. So the short answer to that is, yes, you could do it by either TPO or a condition, but looking at that plan there, I would have reservations about the, the wisdom of doing it. Ian Carruthers. Thanks, Chairman. I suppose site visit would have answered a lot of these questions, I suppose, that, that have been asked, and it would it certainly would have answered them for me, but I'm looking at the plan of history, and is that material or not? I mean, I think it's got to be seen as being a material consideration in regards to this. And I'm just, I'll sum up and... I'll not take long, Chair, but there's potential enhancements compared to what compared to uh, what is there already. But I think come back to this uh, plan and history, the material consideration, and if we put forward a proposal to actually approve this today, it's it's uh, the ability for the for the for the the council as it sits here that is committed today to actually say, okay, we think it complies with the small building group. There's been a a recommendation or has there actually been a determination in regards to whether it's a small building group or no, it complies with that. Is there a sense of place? There'll be a different views in regards to whether it is or not. But the fact if we do make an exception to policy, I suppose what I'm looking for is in is in guidance, because I would imagine I will move. I think this is it's because of its history, where it sits, it's out with with, with the, the the flood area, I think it my personal view is it would be an enhancement to the area. It's it's gathering that up and putting it forward in for the, for the reason of making an exception to policy, 
there's two points I'm making here. Can we actually say it does as a committee, it does actually comply with the guidance? As we've got it, I don't think we can do so. I'm clear on that, but I'll just get reminded. And secondly, as an exception to policy, is the fact that the plan and history a material consideration that we could actually propose as a way to, uh, in which this could be approved? I'll ask David to reply. My view would be that it would be pointless having a committee if all we did was endorse some decisions by, by a previous committee that didn't follow policy, but that's no for me to decide. That's for you people to decide. David, can you reply to Ian's question, please? Yes, I'm going to take them in reverse order, if that's okay. In terms of the weight to be given to the fact there is a planning history in the site, you know, clearly there is some planning history of this. What you have to weigh up is how relevant that is in terms of the time period. If it was something that had happened, say, four years ago and the permission had only just expired, then that is something which you would give considerable weight to. I think the fact that we're talking about the original permission dates back to 1989, uh, 1990, sorry, probably 1990, 27 years is a long time. There's been a lot of change in the development plan since that time. Uh, the 1999 structure plan has come and gone. You've got the 2014 LDP in place now. So I would certainly consider that the period of time is such that it is a consideration, but one of such limited weight, you really shouldn't be considering that to override other issues. In terms of whether or not it con uh, constitutes a small building group, obviously you've got the officer's opinion on that, that we consider it is too disparate. There's no sense of place about this to justify that. If members were minded to grant permission as an exception to policy, then I think you would have to argue that it was on the basis that you did consider it was a small building group, and that was really the uh, the justification for you to make um, an approval that uh, the, the buildings which were there and its location, its sense of place were such as to merit it being a small building group. And we would therefore have to take that forward in due course regarding this as a small building group. Thanks for that advice, Jim. Do you want to come back, come back I'd like to just, if it, I would like to come back just before you go to the final recommendation, Chairman, if that's okay, just to make a proposal. No problem, Ian Blake. Thank you, Chairman. Two points, really. One is for clarification. Uh, when the applicant uh, gave his presentation, he mentioned the fact that initially two, the permission was given for two houses and only one was built. From the report, uh, that's unclear because they appear to be in different years. That, that's one point. And secondly, uh, when David gave his interpretation of a, a small building group, it's something that has evolved over a period of years. From the report, the two houses there that were granted within this so-called or possibly considered building group within a period of a year. So I would you know, kind of challenge the fact that that is evolving over a period of time. David, you want to do that with what Billy did? Billy? Um, paragraph 1.4 of the report uh, details the planning history of the application site itself uh, and in 1.5 planning history adjacent to the application site. There was a, a original, originally an individual application for the site which was refused. Shortly after that, a further application came in. That application was for two plots, plot one and plot two. Plot one is what is now the current application site. Plot two is what is now the dwelling house known as Beckfoot. So outline planning permission was initially granted for, uh, on the basis of that application for two plots. Um, only one of them was taken forward at that stage, which was the one at Beckfoot. Um, a further application was made um, for what was reserved matters at that time, and that house was subsequently built in the early 1990s. Um, plot one, which is the current application site, um, Got also got a subsequent application for detailed planning permission, but was not implemented. So it lapsed unimplemented. With that, you want to come back again? Yeah, it's really just my uh, time to make my second point answered. Uh, but from what Billy said there, that kind of compounds it, the fact that there were actually three houses granted planning permission within the period of year, no. albeit only two of them were built. No. I'm not being clear. There were only ever two planning permission for two houses. 
The other houses that are being considered as part of the group are Kirk Kirkland Farmhouse, which is a historic farmhouse. Got it? Yeah. Apologies if I wasn't being clear. It's the confusion over the Kirkland Farmhouse and... Uh, OK, right. We're going to try and bring this to a conclusion. Ian, did you want to come back? Thank you, Chairman. I would... Sense of place is a hard thing to define. Uh, I think the two examples that were given by David were good examples because I know them in my area, but they're larger settle settlements, certainly when it comes to small building groups. You have much smaller ones as well, like the Burnheads when I think of, uh, which is not that far away, Fiegelsfield within the Andale Nest area. Small, confined, but still has that sense of place, so on and so forth. Come back to the advice that was given, I think uh, I would move it to approve, because taking each case in its own merits, I feel this has got a sense of place. We've had information regards the applicant and other other uh, members of the council, that, uh, the committee have actually expressed their views, community spirit, sense of place, so on and so forth. So if it's uh, in regards to, keep me right with, with the wording, certainly, but that's certainly my feeling is that we should make an exception because we feel that it, uh, I feel that it has got a sense of place and that's been demonstrated as part of the, the planning process today. Well, I have a proposal so far to go with the officer recommendation and I have one to, to to overturn the officer recommendation. Do I have a pardon? Did you second Archie's proposal, David McKee? Oh, because David McKee, I thought, I thought Councillor McKee offered a view and an opinion, but okay, if you're now seconded, that's fine. If Ian has a second, that will then decide whether or no that a uh, is acceptable as a, an exception to policy. Currently, Ian doesn't have a second. Councillor Blake, or Councillor Blake, okay. I'm quite David, happy to does that it. fit? Can we agree to proceed on that basis? I mean, looking at the wording, I'm not even sure that it's it's an exception to policy in this instant. It's a matter of interpretation. Uh, it's Councillor Carruthers' interpretation, if I'm correct, that you consider it does comply with policy. It's not an exception because it has a sense of place and therefore it complies with policy H3 in terms of being a small building group. Okay, you happy with that as advice, Ian? Absolutely. It's my view of today with information that we've gathered and, and been presented today is my view that it does constitute a small building group, has a sense of place, so on and so forth. Okay, Lucy, can we proceed to the vote, please? I have a motion um, posed by Councillor Drybra and seconded by Councillor McKee to agree the officer's recommendations and refuse the application. And I have an amendment proposed by Councillor Crothers and seconded by Councillor Great Blake to approve on the basis that it does comply with policy H3 as a small building group. That formal board seems to be acceptable. And um, clarification, it would just be with the uh, Appropriate conditions, I assume, in terms of all the flood risk and access and all the usual Absolute things. Absolutely, potential tree, uh, tree preservation orders so on and so forth, or conditions, actually, in regard to that. No tree preservation orders, so the conditions, as, as you mentioned earlier. Okay, we'll proceed to the vote. Councillor Dempster. <coughs> Motion. Councillor John Campbell. Motion. Councillor Blake. Amendment. Councillor Dougie Campbell. Motion. Councillor Crothers. Amendment. Councillor Drybra. Motion. Councillor Juicy. Amendment. Councillor Hagman. Motion. Councillor Hislop. Councillor James. Amendment. Councillor Martin. Motion. Councillor McKee. Motion. Councillor Murray. Motion. Councillor Tate. Amendment. Councillor Young. Motion. And I can confirm that the motion carries with nine votes to six and that members have agreed to refuse the application as per the officer's recommendations.
Thanks very much, Lucy. <clears throat> we go to agenda item number five. Erection of dwelling house and formation of access at vacant lot adjacent to Ochtalur Way, Trinwa. This is a full planning permission application. For recommendations to refuse and the case officers, Billy Murray. For those of us that were present in the, the last council, the agent that spoke to this application experienced extreme difficulty and under, he, he was deaf, he, he couldn't understand the questions that had been set him. So this time he has submitted a statement which Lucy will read. It will make it much more reasonable and acceptable eh, eh, in a way forward for that particular gentleman. So the, the gentleman is eh, Clark Preston, but Lucy will read his statement before we proceed. We'll go through the process <laughs> first. We'll go through the process first. Eh, we, eh, we have Billy. Billy, will you do the presentation, please? Yes, thank you, Chair. Uh, this is an application for planning permission for the erection of a dwelling house and formation of an access on a plot at Octolure Waste and Ra. Um, this is effectively a resubmission of a previous application and which was at committee in July 2016. Uh, that application was refused. So this is the application site uh, on the northern side of Octolure Way. Uh, Octolure Way is the, the main distributor road through that area. Uh, so you see the, the two roundabouts, that's all Octolure Way. That's an aerial view of the application site and surroundings. Um, this is the site uh, from the southeast, so I'm looking towards the application site. The application site is behind the chain link, link fencing that you see there. This is a closer view. Um, the only difference since this application was previous at the committee was that the, the fencing has been extended. Uh, so the two timber posts you see there extend the fencing. Um, from what was previously the, the, the maximum extent of the fencing uh, to the edge of the pedestrian footway. Um, this is a view of the site from the southern side, the opposite side of the road from Ochtrelure Way. So again, the site is behind the fence that you can just see the posts there. And this is a closer view of the site from the south. Uh, site slopes away, slopes downwards away from the road uh, towards the existing dwelling houses. Uh, this is the view of the site from the opposite direction. Again, note the existing uh, high chain link fencing uh, and the extended fencing uh, across to the rear of the pedestrian footway. This is a view within the application site, giving a, a, a picture of the site. Slopes down from the road, so Octolure Way is on your right in that view. The site slopes down to the left towards the existing dwelling houses. This is a close view of the front boundary of the site, so that's from the southwestern corner. Um, this is the, the view into the site from the southeastern site boundary, so that's down at the lower part of the site um, where there's a mutual boundary with the existing dwelling houses. That's a closer view of the similar from a similar location, looking over the existing dwelling houses set at lower level there. Um, these are a number of views taken from the existing development looking back up towards the site. So this is a view of the site from Ailsa Gateway. The site is the sloping area of green that you see uh, centrally located in that view. Um, this is the site looking over the rear garden wall of 32 Ailsa Gate. Um, these slides were, uh, apart from simply showing members uh, the character of the site, these slides were specifically taken because there are third party representations raising issues in connection with overlook and privacy in their rear gardens. So this was these slides were to give an impression of what the situation was there. So that's looking over 32 Ailsa Gateway. These are the two rear gardens of 32 and 34 Ailsa Gateway. The site is on the right there behind the retaining wall uh, at higher level, obviously. Um, this is next door, looking uh, as much as I could at 34 Ailsa Gateway. Again, you see the site. You can just see the, the left-hand boundary of the site, the fence there, uh, and the green area is the application site itself. And that's a closer view from the same location, showing the difference in levels between the garden ground 
at 34 rails gateway and the application site itself. Um, these are a number of views just to give a general impression of Ochtralur Way, uh, uh, the characteristics of the site and surroundings itself. Um, this, because streetscape and townscape are key issues in the determination of this application, these slides are to give an impression of how the area is at present. So this is Ochtralur Way. It's a, defined as a distributor road, um, which is wider. Uh, it has two metre footways on either side set behind two metre grass verges. That's a view looking in the opposite direction. In these views, I'm stand, standing more or less opposite the site itself. There's a slight rise in the road there. Um, again, members may note there are some representations from third parties that refer to that rise. Um, again, this is just a general view of Octolure Way. The site's on the right in that view. Again, from the same place, looking in the other direction. Um, this is, uh, again, a general view of Ochtralure Way, and perhaps in this slide I can highlight the fact that the, the, the bushes and things you see on the right there behind the fence are the landscaped area that's referred to in the report uh, that was approved, and indeed was a condition of a previous permission for housing development at Ochtralure Way. Again, that's it, uh, showing it on the left. Um, the application site was fenced in with that landscaping area, albeit that, as you'll see later and as it's referred to in the report, it didn't actually form part of the area that was subject of the condition. Um, there's no explanation why it was fenced in with that landscaping area. Um, so again, that's just highlighting the landscaped area adjacent to the site, the planted area. And that's a closer view of the existing planting adjacent. So that, that's an extract from the site layout and landscaping plan for the 2004 approval for um, the extensive housing development at Ochtralure Way. The area in question is that the long, narrow area shown hatched in that drawing. The application site itself is just in the extreme top right-hand corner of that view. So you can maybe just make out the two houses that were shown in the earlier slides at lower level, and the application site is, is right up in the top right-hand corner. So, as I said a moment ago, the actual condition doesn't include the application site, but for whatever reason, the application site was fenced in with the area. So these are the plans submitted with the application. That's location, site plans, and cross-section. Uh, the only difference from the previous application is that the dwelling house is now uh, a small, compact, one-bedroom, single-storey dwelling house, whereas the previous application in 2016 was for a more substantial two-storey or, or one-and-a-half-storey uh, three-bedroom dwelling house. So this is the dwelling house that's now proposed. So the key issues here are whether or not uh, the proposed development uh, accords with uh, or, or matches the, the character of the development in the area with particular regard to the streetscape and existing townscape. The main issue here is that Ochtralure Way is designed as a distributor road and with no accesses taken from it. Uh, there are no existing individual dwelling houses with individual accesses from Ochtralure Way apart from one at the extreme uh, northern end of Australia Way, which was pre-existing. So in other words, it was there before all this other development took place. So for its whole length of almost two kilometers, there are no individual accesses um, from Australia Way. Um, so the conclusion is that, you know, this proposal with an individual access from Australia Way uh, would be completely at odds with the existing and important streetscape and streetscape and distinct character of the area. Uh, so the recommendation is to refuse for the reason stated in the report, which is the same reason for which the previous application in 2016 was refused. Thanks again, Billy. Members, any questions for the case officer? No? In that case, we will now come to the written presentation from the... Agent Clark Preston.
Lucy, eh, our timing for three minutes. Statement by Clark Preston, agent for the above planning application. He and the applicant fully support the need for planning control, but believe it must be consistent and fairly judged on its own individual merit. However, he considers that for some reason, this has not been the case here, and he sincerely trusts that the Planning Applications Committee will agree with their reasoning and approve this application. With regard to the report, he wishes to comment on the following. Paragraph 4.3 confirms it is an infill slash windfall site and satisfies the criteria of H1B in principle. Paragraph 4.5 confirms that another individual house has direct access Access direct from Ockreture Lure Way. Paragraph 4.8. He does not consider that it is reasonable to assume that the current application site itself was to be included in the planting area for the 2004 development. Paragraphs 4.9 to 4.13 address neighbours' objections and shows it would not represent a material conflict. Paragraph 4.14, no objection from the Council's roads or access officers to the application. Paragraph 4.17, the report states that the distributor road to remain access free, but earlier in paragraph 4.5, it states that another individual house has direct access from this road, which he considers to be inconsistent to say the least. As there is no objection from the Council's roads officer, he finds it remarkable that planning officers are overruling the roads department on this issue and would ask the committee for their view on this. The other two houses referred to in this section and supporting documentation adjacent to the nearby care home was not to do with access as stated in the report, but highlighting that the two houses are at odds with the street scene and indeed it was the same case officer which is recommending refusal for this application which approved the other two house, nearby houses. He has also enclosed photographs of the application site for the committee to view, demonstrating that this site is not an open green space nor a planting area as portrayed in the report. Taking into account these comments together with all the application documentation, he trusts that the application should be approved and he respectfully asks members of the committee to approve this application or to undertake a site visit prior to determination. Thank you very much, Lucy. And whilst members can take account of the observations in that uh, representation, we can question it. So we go now straight to session. We're now in session. Archie? I remember being here last year for the for the application here, uh, and, and it was appropriate that the uh, presentation made by the uh, Clark Preston was written, uh, was read out because of his, his hearing, you know, and I wish him well in the future. I still don't see any difference from last year's, and I would go with the recommendations on this one. So. Are there any alternative views, Ian? I've not, I've not, not got a, an alternative view, but just, I was, I, I don't remember this one at all, so I take it I wasn't out. But just for further information for myself, uh, and so I'm absolutely clear what's being asked for when I'm looking at page 59. You've got a, a road which isn't, hasn't got a name to it, from what I can see here. Op, op to lower way, sorry, it was referred to earlier. And the access is being asked to be given from that, so I'm sure. And just uh, that's 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 what's being proposed. And I, would, I, I would imagine I'm looking at the site layout below, and, and you would have thought if it was, because uh, the question is being asked, I think, by as part of the statement, if there was a more natural layout, it should be something that would reflect almost even a mirror image, possibly, of what's on the left-hand side of that uh, that turning point, uh, just just to the left-hand side as you're looking at it. I'm only trying to understand more of the the layout. What is it? Is something here acceptable for the council, or is it absolutely ruled out? And because if 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 we rule it out, as it's each case on its own merits, I understand that. But I mean. This is the second time there's a change, and they're constantly coming back. Is there something that, that the council would accept? And if it is, surely that should be communicated straightforward. And just if there's a either that, it should be quite clear. We should through the planning process, the local development plan, rule it out one way or another. I, I think we can't prevent folks submitting applications. We can't prevent folks resubmitting them because it's a free try. I think that uh, Billy explained that the size of the house 
very considerably for the original application. We can't kind of tell folk not to apply, but I would imagine that uh, if another application or further conversation was to take place, they would get appropriate advice for the officers. But uh, David, you maybe want to help in with this one? Yes, I, mean, I think as, as Billy Slide pointed out, there's a fundamental issue with this one. The the site would be the first on this stretch of Ochter Lurway, which would involve a house turning its uh, back on the rest of the development and having an access directly from a distributor road at a higher level as well. So for all those reasons, it's just a development that is very much at odds with the overall feel of Ilsa Gate behind it. It's just out of character. I, if we could think of a solution to this one, we would have suggested it. But unfortunately, it's it's one of these ones where it's the wrong development in the wrong place, I'm afraid. No, thanks for that, Chairman. I think when I'm looking at it again, you actually see it's probably around about land ownership issues. Is, is where it looks like a natural access point through the turning point, like I say, but when you actually see the boundary lines, it's probably more about land ownership. So no, nothing, nothing else to say, Chairman. Thanks, Ian. Hey, Jim McComb. Chair, I'm just a wee bit uncomfortable with the fact that we have two branches of the council apparently at odds with each other. The planning department are advising that Ochterlure Way is a distributor road and as such should not have individual accesses taken from it. But the roads authority in 414 clearly state they have no objection in principle to individual access being taken from such roads. I, th I think we, we need to avoid the mixed messages coming through here. I don't know that it is mixed because the roads authority are given an opinion as on roads, but the planning authority have a completely different view in terms of, of, of suitability. So each are professional and given a professional opinion. But again, I'll refer to David. Uh, thank you, Chair. Now, uh, if I just refer you to page 69 and the actual reason for refusal, it's not on grounds of road safety, which is all that road officers would be looking at. They were saying, is there an appropriate level of visibility coming out onto this that would make it safe? Their view is that it is. Our view is really it's to do with the built character of the development, that by putting a house here in opposite direction to the rest of Ilsa Gate and the other development around is going to be at odds with the, the built character of the area. So really it's the reason for refusal isn't, if we were putting up for refusal on road safety grounds and roads officers were saying it's fine, yes, I would agree that there's maybe an issue there. That's not the grounds for refusal. David McKee. It's just a comment on why that site's become available. When planning permission was given for that housing development, that, my understanding was that land, trees and whatnot were supposed to be planted in that land. And I think we are making a rod for our own back, not ensuring that these things are carried out. There's a lump of land there that's suitable for a housing house, let's put it that way, that shouldn't have been there at all. It should have been covered by the conditions that were on the, the site application for the housing development. I think that was well thrashed at the last time round, Joe, but you're right. Uh, so currently we have a proposal to go with the officer recommendation. There have been a number of questions posed since then. Is everybody content to go with the officer recommendation or is there an alternative proposal? In that case, a unanimous decision. Can you confirm the decision of the committee, please, Lucy? And the committee have decided to refuse the application as per the officer's recommendation. I have received notification that lunch has arrived. Do you want to complete? I'm asking the members a question, no, not just you. Do you want to complete the paper? Do you want to continue and see how you go on? Or do you want to stop it after 12? Right. Okay. We come to agenda item six. Erection of two dwelling houses at land adjacent to one Shaw's Home Road, Closeburn Thornhill. This is an application for planning permission in principle. Recommendations to refuse, and the case officer is Claire Eckstein. Claire, when you're ready, will you take us through your presentation, please? Thank you, Chair. 
Uh, this application is for planning permission in principle for the erection of two dwelling houses. At um, land adjacent to one Shaw's home, Shaw's, Shaw's home Road in Close Farm. Uh, the application site is uh, 1,605 square metres and lies on the south side of Shaw's Home Road and to the east of number one Shaw's Home Road on part of an agricultural field. Uh, this shows the inset boundary for uh, Close Burn uh, and the application uh, which lies out with this. This shows the uh, ex existing block plan uh, indicating that the site sloping away from the road. And this is uh, an indicative block plan showing the proposed dwelling houses uh, with the accesses onto Shaw's Home Road. So going on to the site photographs, uh, looking from the east, look at, this is looking along the site frontage onto Shaw's Home Road with the application site on the left-hand side. And this is uh, looking from the other direction, uh, looking eastwards uh, with site on the, the right hand side and this is uh, panning right from the previous photographs with one short home road on the right. Uh, this is looking back into the site and this is looking eastwards uh, with one short home road in the center and the next photographs were just panning right uh, from the previous photographs uh, just to give you uh, idea of where various properties, other properties are. Lynburn is the White House uh, sort of in the centre. And then panning right from the previous photograph, Lynburn, White House to the left, uh, Park View, which is the, the sandstone house to the centre. And panning right again, previous photograph, uh, number 65. This is the White House, which lies on the corner of Shaw's Home Road and the A76. These photographs just show a uh, close-up of the uh, existing field access and the next one just panning left from the previous photograph uh, showing uh, the slope down to the site. Um, a full assessment of the proposal is set out in the committee report, but just to highlight the, the key policy issues, uh, policy H4 uh, applies as the site uh, lies immediately outside the settlement inset boundary of Close Burn identified in the local development plan. Uh, policy H4 uh, only supports further housing where there is an identified shortfall in the wider housing market area, which in this case is Dumfries. The Dumfries housing market area itself extends from Dumfries up to Connell to Moffat and Lockerbie. And as set out in paragraph 4.5 of the report, uh, there remains an effective land supply in the Dumfries housing market area, so the principle cannot be supported. In addition to this, and as set out in paragraph 4.6, uh, the location of the site on part, part of a larger field, whereas noted from the site photographs, uh, there are no existing natural features or topographic stops, so the proposal would introduce inappropriate development to, uh, contrary to policies uh, H4 and OP2. It is for these reasons uh, that the proposed two dwelling houses are contrary to policy and the recommendation is to refuse as set out in the report. Thank you, Claire. Any members, any questions for the case officer? In that case, oh, Councillor McKay. Hi, just to leave it clarity, given that we've used up the land supply in Closeburn, could an assessment be done to seek out other suitable building plots in that area before the next development plan is due. David? Well, as Claire alluded to, you've got to look at the whole housing market area, which in this case is the Dumfries housing market area. And at the, this particular moment, there is no shortfall within that overall area. Um, as I understand it, this particular site was not put forward as part of the call for sites exercise in the LDP2 exercise. That would have been the opportunity for that to have come forward and be considered as part of that, but uh, it hasn't been submitted as such, so it can't be considered that. The, there may be other appropriate sites within Closeburn to look at, but that's something which will go through the LDP process. 
Yeah. So if there are no other questions for the case officer, we'll have the representative. We have one objector and then the applicant. Can we have John Green, please? John, again, you will have three minutes and I will remind you with 30 seconds to go just to draw your presentation yep. to a conclusion, please. Chair, thank you for the opportunity to attend the meeting today and for the opportunity to speak in relation to this application. Uh, I reside at Parkview Closeburn, which was one of the houses that you saw on the, the photographs there. Uh, Parkview faces on to the land where the applicant is seeking permission to erect two dwelling houses. I, along with many of my neighbours, have a number of concerns regarding this application, and these concerns have been already summarised in the report to the Committee from the Planning and Regulatory Services. Whilst I'm sure you would not wish me to go ever over every point raised in the report before you, I'd like to make a couple of comments as follows. The flood risk management team have indicated that they have no historical records showing flooding on this site. As a resident of Closeburn for the past 10 years, I can state that whilst they may not have any records uh, of it, this particular field floods severely every winter, and indeed sometimes in the spring and autumn as well. And I have uh, already submitted some photographs which, which prove this. Uh, I don't know if they are actually available uh, for you or you've seen them already. But certainly anybody that travels that road on a regular basis um, will know that, in fact, that, flood, uh, that field does flood uh, uh, quite severely. My neighbours and myself have some concerns regarding road safety at the site, should this application be approved. I accept that the Roads Department have suggested mitigating measures which I have no doubt will go some way to reducing the risk, but the very fact that they have seen fit to suggest the imposition of these measures is indicative of the fact that they must accept that there would be a problem in the first place. The road width at the site narrows considerably, and due to the fact that many residents do not have off-street parking, the road is effectively single track owing to the presence of their parked vehicles. There's also a bend in the road, which again you saw in the photographs there, which further reduces visibility, uh, particularly uh, when, when vehicles are parked uh, outside the houses. Shaw's Home Road provides the only vehicular access for a large part of the village and services in the region of 80 plus homes, as well as providing access for large agricultural and delivery vehicles to a number of farms in the area. Given all of that, the road can be very busy with traffic. And certainly at this time of the year when, when silage uh, is being made, then it is, it is very busy at that time as you well. You have 30 seconds to go, John. As you travel north and enter the village of Closeburn, you can see that all of the housing stock at the south end of the village and through the main street is fairly old and of the same type of character. New housing stock would look out of place and would not be in character with the existing housing. The shape of the land is also such that new housing would not merge into the landscape, adding further to the impression that these houses are add-ons rather than being part of the village. Can you just draw to a conclusion, please? In view of all of this, as well as the recommendation from uh, planning, I would ask you to refuse the application. Thank you. Thanks very much, John. Can you just remain seated in case any members have a question for you? Yep. Anybody have questions? Uh, Ivor and then Elaine. Just a couple of points, Mr. Green. Uh, with regard to the flooding, is it the site that floods or is it the field? Because I have travelled up and down the past yep. when we used to go to Thornhill Market and there was, yep. so uh, it was, I would say, further s south on the 76 that you'd actually have seen the flooding. And the other point is if the house types, which is something that we could look at in the future, because this is planning principle were to reflect the sort of cottages that were there already, would that alleviate that problem? Um, certainly, to take the second point first, I suppose, um, yeah, I mean, at the end of the day, that would, that would uh, uh, take the, the character aspect out, uh, out of that uh, completely. Um, having said that, I think that um, they would still look as like add-ons, really, because because of the shape of the landscape that's there. Um, in relation to your first point about the flooding, um, the whole field does flood on a regular basis. I accept that the flood water itself may not encroach right into the corner 
of the the, the site where the, the houses are proposed. Um, but it is, um, despite what anybody else might say, it is very extensive. I mean, uh, I think it was uh, earlier this year, at the beginning of this year, uh, we had swans living on, on the field for um, several weeks. The, the flood water comes right up to just about two to three metres away from that, uh, that boundary wall that you can see there. So whilst it doesn't go right into the corner, it is extensive, and my view is that it would impinge on the site as proposed. Thanks, John. Uh, Elaine? Yes, sir. Thank you. Um, my question also was about the, the flooding. Um, the advice from the flood risk management uh, team, it refers to fluvial floodplains, which would be like river flooding, but certainly the impression I've had when I've observed the flooding in the field is it is actually more associated with heavy rainfall than... Yes, that's correct, effect. it is. Thanks, Elaine. Any other questions for the objector? In that case, we take your seat again, John. What, you have some... Oh, sorry, Jim. Mr Chair, Mr Green, would you accept that building development may actually provide an opportunity to improve drainage on that site? Well, I, I mean, I'm no building engineer, so I don't know the answer to that question. Um, all I know is that, as what I see uh, every winter, and I see how much that floods, I, I don't know whether whether uh, building on the, the land would improve matters or not. I know that um, that the landowner has tried or at least I believe has tried on a number of occasions previously to uh, to to resolve the situation, but plainly it hasn't worked. Thanks, Jim. I think this time, John, okay. you can take your seat again. Thank you. Thank you. We'll now have the applicant, Craig Sloan. Craig, the same arrangement will apply. You'll have three minutes and with 30 seconds to go. I'll ask you to draw your presentation to a conclusion. <clears throat> Afternoon, Chairman, Councillors. Craig Sloan shows me a farm, Closeburn, and I'm the applicant for the proposal. I'm applying for the outline permission for two houses. Taking into account the objector's, con objector's concerns, the Roads Department has no issues, the Flood Risk Team have no issues. I agree that there is surface water in the field at times, but not near the road level and not where the dwellings are proposed. The design would be single storey and in keeping with traditional features of the village. There will be ample parking and turning areas within the site. The rear gardens can be landscaped as per adjacent houses with trees and bushes. This will also help to blend the properties into the existing countryside. If what we are proposing is a continuation of the existing rows of houses, then how can it be inappropriate? Having a continuation of the existing rows of houses should be seen as a natural progression. Closeburn is a popular area as the Wood End Way development proved. The LHA has only one house left. There is no more land available through the term of the LDP. Will the LDP too have emphasis on rural communities? Therefore, more local housing is required. If there is no more local housing in areas, then that will force people to move away. This discriminates against the local area. Closeburn cannot be de denied new housing because there is housing available elsewhere. What good is it to Closeburn that there are houses available in Dumfries or Moffat, for example? Are we saying that Closeburn will never expand again? No other land is identified in the LDP for housing in Closeburn. There are currently very few houses for sale in the area and there is more needed. Local people want to stay in their local area. There are facilities that must remain strong like the local school, which requires support from new housing to keep going. Thank you. Thanks very much. Do any members have any questions for the applicant, Archer? Thank you, uh, Craig. Uh, David mentioned earlier about the, the calls for sites uh, within the, the HMA. Uh, yeah, this, this never came forward. Was there any particular reason why it never came forward? 
No, um, there was a large development at Woodown Way, um, which has proved very popular, and therefore we thought we'd take the chance to put this forward now. Thank you, Archie. Elaine. Thank you, Chair. Um, I'm presuming that you are actually the <coughs> owner of the, of, of the land. Am yes. I correct? Yeah. I mean, you, you're, you're proposing two properties at this time, but if the properties which are actually out, out with the settlement boundary, how can we be certain that if this was passed now, there wouldn't be another two houses, another two houses that you know that, that it could be a precedent for development on agricultural land? Well, I suppose I couldn't answer that. It would depend how how it got on here. But as I was saying before, that line of housing follows the natural progression of the village there, and it's all within a 30 mile an hour zone. Thanks, Elaine. Any other questions for the applicant? John, and then Iva. Thank you, Chair. I just wondered, you restricted the development to two houses. Have you extended it as seems viable to three, four, or even five houses, you would have had to meet the developer contribution. Was that a factor in your submission? Uh, just uh, all of it was a factor. I mean, um, yeah, it's outside the settlement boundary. I'm uh, paying £800 for the application. It made sense to go for two, see how I got on. If, uh, if, I, if they did go, then maybe it was a possibility to do another two. This makes sense to, to do that, I think. Thanks, John. Iva. Mr Sloan, with regards to the flooding issue that was brought up, now, my recollection of the field, maybe a dim and distant past, because it's been a while since the market was at Thornhill, but it's a sort of basin shape. Now, if you look at the photo on the wall there, if you come to, is it Lynn Burn, the White House, that was on that last photo? There's a sort of, well, the white one that's just went out of sight there. Does the water actually come up to there? Because there is a, it looks like a dip on the landscape there where the, I don't know, the flat roof extension or what you would call that. Yeah, I know where you are. Um, is that where the actual flood level comes to? Because it looks slightly lower. No, it's, I would say you can see the darker grass there, the rougher grass. It's halfway up the, the green, if you like. Um, It was, it's marked, we'll have it marked out in the plans. It's uh, over 1.7 metres below road level. Thanks, Ivor. Any oh. other questions for the applicant? In that case, Craig, would you take your seat again, please? Okay. Five members were now in session. Archie, any in? Chair, again, just, just looking at this one, and unfortunately it is outside the um, housing development settlement boundary, um, and taking everything in consideration, I think we can go with the recommendations in the report. Thanks, Archie. Ian? Yeah, it, just, it was actually on 2.2, and it was mentioned earlier, I think, by uh, is it John, I think, John Campbell. But just, I think at the time when, when, when these would be submitted, we clearly made a decision last week at the Economy, Environment, Infrastructure Committee. I think that wouldn't be the case now, anyways. But at the time when, when they were submitted, it would be the case. As it stands, I think it's because we've made a ruling on that now. It's five or below. It wouldn't, it wouldn't be affected in regards to the, the education contribution. That was the only real point. I just think going back to some of the points that have been made earlier, looking at this in a fairly much black and white case, uh, local development plan is it, it was probably the right place to. Have, how to had had this addressed? You've looked at the, the the fuller picture, and if there's a continuation, I understand where the, the applicant's coming from, and say he's almost like dipping his toe in the water to see if this is will it be successful or not. Why spend too much? Uh, why not try and get an understanding? Maybe no, clearly, clearly doesn't understand the processes that the council have, as most people don't. They don't understand. They will go through with the main issues of the court and local development plan and how the policies this can be forwarded. But I still do take on point. I've got. Settlements in, in my area, Pulfoot's one in, in particular we came across where there's no settlement boundary in a, a, in a, a settlement this size and there's absolutely no identified sites and there's absolutely no wet round, had a look, there's nowhere. There's, that, it's capped off, it's finished. And this is in the same boat because they're saying there's absolutely houses in the free small fit, Lockerbie, so on and so forth within the housing market area that says, well, no, we've got enough to keep us going for the next 
five, ten, fifteen, twenty-five years as it stands until such time as we go through, we go through that process. I think this is actually a weak link in regards to the local development plan and the processes which we undertake. So I'm not going to move to go dig in against this account on this. I think you look in a straightforward black and white terms, but there is a process potentially for the applicant out with. Thanks, Chairman. Thanks for that. So we have a proposal that we go with the recommendation, Ivor. Chair, it's maybe just echoing Councillor Crothers' points, but the fact is, if you actually didn't have a line round here, you'd actually say, if it's a small building group, adding two on there or four houses to bring it to the road would be rounding off the development because that reflects what's on the other side. It's maybe something that we can't address today because of the case that we have the local development plan two coming through it hasn't been entered, but it's maybe something that in the future the applicant can ask for it to be considered. Um, I think you could get a sort of natural boundary because I have concerns about the lie of the land just on the outside of the application where it might be a flood risk possibility. Um, and the only other thing is under 2.2, uh, this was for two houses, and if you take £3,907.70 and double it, it would have been 7800 odd, but it's only 39000 3900 Maybe that's why our education system's not working so well, if the education can't double the money. Well, without entering into a debate about the LDP today, the, the, I mean, it, it says in the committee report quite clearly that there might be other opportunities elsewhere. It's not for us to design the LDP and determine what sites are considered. It also says in the report there's a defensible boundary which causes an issue should a bigger application come forward. But I presume that if there are any only alternative proposals, it's a unanimous decision to go with the officer recommendation. Lucy, can you confirm the decision of the committee, please? And the committee have decided to go with the officer's recommendation and refuse the application. Thanks, Lucy. We come to agenda item seven. Erection of dwelling house, installation of shared sewage treatment plant and soak away information of vehicular access. And that was A and B. Erection of dwelling house, installation of shared sewage treatment plant and soak away information of vehicular access at land at Graham's Field, Echo Fecken. The application type is planning and permission principle for application A and planning and planning permission principle for application B. The recommendation is to refuse both application A and application B and the case officer is Lindsay Cameron. Lindsay, will you take us through your presentation? Thank you, Chair. This first slide um, is a location plan um, showing the application site, um, which are two adjoining areas of land situated at Graham's Field Farm, which is located to the north of Echo Fecken and the M74 motorway. This slide shows a block plan for each of the application sites, including a shared private sewage treatment plant. The application sites which extend to 2,800 square metres and 2,300 square metres approximately lie to the north of the B725 public road. This is an indicative site plan. Moving on to the photographs, this first photograph is taken on the approach to the road junction motorway slip road um, from the west and shows the existing houses in the locality. Travelling to the east side of the roundabout at the motorway junction, this photograph looks back in a northwesterly direction across the road junction and the three existing dwellings. Turning to look northeast along the B725, this photo shows the existing houses around the road junction with Brown Moor House, the sandstone property, set back along the road. Moving along the B725, the application sites are located on the left behind the two trees and the hedgerow. Brown Muir House to the right and Grahamsfield Farmhouse, uh, which can just be seen in the distance. Continuing along the B725, this is a view along the site frontage of the second B2 spot. And taken from a point just beyond Grahamsfield Farmhouse, this photo looks back along the B725 towards the application site. 
Again, looking back along the B725, the application sites are located on the right, with Brownmoor House on the left. And finally, this photograph is a reverse view, looking back along the site frontage of the two plots. In conclusion, the proposals are considered contrary to the provisions of the stated development plan policy. There has been no change in development plan policy or other circumstances since refusal of the previous applications in January 2017. And as there are no material considerations to override the presumption in favour of a determination in accordance with the development plan, it is recommended that proposals be refused for the reasons set out in the report. Thanks, Lindsay. Do any members have any questions for the case officer? Ian? Just one small one. Uh, I think it was uh, it was alleviated because it looks like the, the two sites are conjoined at one point, just to the north, uh, Lindsay. But uh, is that for the water treatment works, just, just so I'm sure? Uh, yes, the, there's an area which is shared for each of the application sites, which is where the uh, private tertiary sewage treatment plant would be located. Yeah, I suppose, suppose the one other thing was, have we got any pictures from, say, the Brown Brownwell House down? That kind of from there, from the site boundary down, just to try and put it into context. Do we have any photos from there? From where, sorry? Brownwell House down. So you've got Brownwell House, I think, which is to your right there, but it looks at it. It's just, just above that. I think predominantly the pictures are taken from the, from the top, from, from what I've seen, right up for Grahamsfield. That's sort of looking along the site frontage with Brownwell House, uh, the application sites on the left. That's probably the best photograph. Okay, thank you. Yep. Okay, Ian, any other questions for the case officer? In that case, this application being called in by Councillor, Car Councillor Karen Carruthers. Is Karen Carruthers, Carruthers attending today, Ian? Fortunately, Chairman, she's unable to because of work commitments. Okay, in that case, we're going into session. We're in session. Uh, Archie? Chair, I know this area well, and it, it just isn't a small building. Group at the end of the day, um, there's, there's huge issues I would see with regards offshoot from that 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 building site into the the B725. Uh, I think for that particular reason, we need to go with the recommended decision of the officer on this one, Chair. I hope it's not a recommended decision of the officer. I hope it's a recommendation from the officer. Uh, okay, Ian. As a lot of people know, I was born and brought up in Ecclefecken, which isn't that far away from here. And before the, the bridge was done away, we just sledged on that area, not exceptionally well. But I just, I, it goes back to the point, I just think this justifies a site visit more than anything. When I, we always refer to as a local Grainsfield as a being area, well, we've seen it as a community, going back to some points that I made early, earlier. Uh, I'd like to just recapture in, in my own mind as well, just the relationship between Brown Moor, uh, between the, the three other uh, Units that are there, residential. It, it refers to three, but there is actually you've got three residential units here. You've got the Brownmoor House on your right hand side, you've got the farm just up there, Grainsfield, and beyond that, you've got cottages, and you've got clear boundaries between the M74 and the West Coast uh, uh, Railway, the, the main line there. So, I mean, I, I would move that we get a site visit, uh, Chairman, just in order to get this clearly into context. I've been by there many times, maybe not, nothing like as often as I used to, but certainly. There's been a sense of place and cohesion there for many numbers of years. It's been gradually uh, built up over the time, but really keen to get a, certainly a site visit, Chairman. I would move that. Okay, we have a proposal for a site visit. Archie? And I propose that we don't go on a site visit, Chair, and we'll go to the recommendation. Currently, we have no seconders for either. Andrew? I'll second a site visit. Yeah, I have a seconder for Archie's proposal, David McKee. So, without ado, we'll go to the vote. Lucy, please. And we have a motion put forward by Councillor Drybra, seconded by Councillor McKee, to determine application today. Not um, that it should matter, but I think the amendment when Ian and, and Andrew had a seconder before David was allowed in, so it should really be Ian Carruthers with a motion, seconded by Andrew. Oh, okay. 
I'll defer to you, Lucy. It'll save a row. <laughs> okay. Um, and Councillor Crothers, seconded by Councillor Juicy, um, not to go on a site visit. No, to go on a site visit. Sorry, Lucy. <laughs> <Thank> you. <laughs> so just remind us again, Lucy. Um, so the motion um, put forward by Councillor Driver and seconded by Councillor McKee is to determine the application today. And the amendment put forward by Councillor Crothers and seconded by Councillor Juicy is to go on a site visit. Councillor Dempster. Motion. Councillor John Campbell. Motion. Councillor Blake. Amendment. Councillor Dougie Campbell. Motion. Councillor Crothers. Amendment. Councillor Driver. Motion. Councillor Juicy. Amendment. Councillor Hagman. Motion. Councillor Hislop. Councillor James. Amendment. Councillor Martin. Motion. Councillor McComb. Amendment. Councillor McKee. Motion. Councillor Murray. Motion. Councillor Tate. Amendment. Councillor Young. Motion. And I can confirm that the motion carries and therefore members will determine the application today. Thanks for that, Lucy. We have a, a, a motion currently from Councillor Driver that still stands. Uh, without a seconder, Councillor Carruthers. Thanks, Chairman. Not to second the, the, the proposal to refuse, but I would, I would think, again, I would much, much prefer the site visit. I know this area reasonably well. It's been a number of years since I've seen it in any great detail, but going back to, to what I said earlier in the gas I've been a lo local resident in Echo Fekin, spent the first 23 years of my life there. Grahamsfield was always known as a, a place a sense of place cohesion, a community. We can for certainly since since uh, since I was a boy, you know, it was grew up going back to the sixties. It was really started to establish after the seventy four right through there, and then that, that whole whole area. So I, I would I would move similar to last time uh, with advice in regards to the to uh, from Mr. Sutty, I think it'll be uh, that it has got a sense of place. I would, my, my view it has got a sense of place. There is a sense of cohesion there. There is a there's clear defined areas. Where this would start and stop, it is, it, I would see this as being defined as a small building group, and I would move it, would, we approve it for that, subject to conditions, if it was to be approved. Okay, David McKee. This this small buildings group it creates a lot of problems. Can you give us an idea of the space between the two houses around about on what's up at Grahamsfield, please? Yes, yeah, certainly. Um, it in the region of 140 metres between the two at the roundabout and Graham's Field Farm. Thanks very much for that. He was still looking for a second for either of the proposals. Councillor McKee has seconded Councillor Dryborough. Ian Blake, are you about to second Ian Carruthers? You read my mind. Thank you. In that case, we'll go to the vote, Lucy. And just remind members, please, what it is they're voting for. And we have a motion put forward by Councillor Dryborough and seconded by Councillor McKee to go with the officer's recommendations and refuse the application for members. And we have an amendment put forward by Councillor Crothers and seconded by Councillor Blake to approve the application on the basis that it does comply with policy H3. Councillor Dempster. Motion. Councillor John Campbell. Motion. Councillor Blake. Amendment. Councillor Dougie Campbell. Motion. Councillor Crothers. Amendment. Councillor Drybra. Motion. Councillor Juicy. Amendment. Councillor Hagman. Motion. Councillor Hislop. Councillor James. Amendment. Councillor Martin. Motion. Councillor McComb. Amendment. Councillor McKee. Motion. Councillor Murray. Motion. Councillor Tate. 
Amendment. I'm so young. Motion. And I can confirm that the motion carries and that the members would be to refuse the application as per the officer's recommendation. Thanks, Lucy. We come to agenda item number eight. Change of use of land of unspecified planning use to domestic garden ground at Craig, Craig Lodge, Auchinmalg, Newton Stewart. As the full application, the recommendation is to approve subject to condition and the case officer is Tracy Carnegie. Tracy, if you'd just like to take us through your presentation, please. Thank you, Chair. Um, the application relates to the change of use of land of unspecified planning use to domestic garden ground at Craig Lodge, Auchinmalg, Newton Stewart. Um, this slide shows the application site. Um, Craig Lodge itself is a one and a half storey semi detached dwelling house um, within the Auchinmalg small building group. Um, and it's located approximately four and a quarter miles southeast of the village of Glen Luce. In addition to Craig Lodge on the site, um, there are a further five properties. Um, and uh, the site's located on the north side of the A747 Glenluce to Port William Public Road. The application site shown outlined and hatched in red, um, and the other ground shown outlined and hatched in blue is other land within the ownership of the applicant. The applicant's dwelling house, Craig Lodge, is located um, to the west of the site, as you can see on the site plan. This is a view of the site from the east, just showing the general arrangement. This is a view of the site from the south, again just showing the general arrangement. The application, uh, the applicant's dwelling house is to the far left of the site. Um, and you can see that it's not conterminous with the application site. This is another view from the south, just showing the uh, general arrangement again and the properties that are existing um, towards the eastern part of the site. The application site um, comprises an area of hard standing um, upon which there is a partly erected structure and also an area of uh, land that's currently in grass just behind the site frontage wall to the left of the access there. This is another view of the site um, from the south from the public road adjacent um, just shown to the left the applicant's dwelling house and um, to the right there the uh, other part of the semi-detached property, Craig Lodge South. Um, you can see on the a part of the application site um, that is the partly um, built structure. Um, the structure was actually erected by the applicant um, on or around September 2015 um, without the benefit of planning permission um, and the structure is presently the subject of ongoing enforcement action um, by the council. Um, the council served an enforcement notice in May 2016 requiring removal of the structure from the site um, and reinstatement of the site within three months but that notice was appealed by the applicant um, to the DPEA. Um, the appeal was considered um, and the council's enforcement notice was upheld um, and it was required that the structure be removed from the site um, by the 11th of January 2017. Um, the structure remains on site um, and the council has now submitted a report to the procurator fiscal in relation to that. The structure itself does not form part of the application that's before you for consideration today and it relates to change of use of the land itself um, to domestic garden ground. This is just another view of the application site, just taken um, opposite the site access. And another view just from a different angle. This is a view from just within the um, access from the public road adjacent, again showing the area that's laid out um, in hard standing um, with the partly built structure. And again, um, just from another angle within the site. 
This is a view of the application site um, taken from the front elevation of Craig Cottage. This is a view of the site from um, just to the west of Craig Cottage. And this is a view of the site from the principal elevation of Craig Lodge South. This is just another view of the site, just from slightly uh, closer in from uh, within the site uh, itself. Finally, this is an aerial view of the site, um, just showing the general arrangement um, prior to the erection of the unauthorised structure, um, which is just... Um, so, in summary, um, it's not considered that the principle of the change of use of the land to domestic garden grounds itself would give rise to any potential land use conflict or would detrimentally affect the level of immunity enjoyed currently by neighbouring proprietors. But it is, however, considered prudent to um, remove permitted development rights conferred by classes 3A, 3B, 3D and 3E of the General Permitted Development Order to ensure that any future proposals relating to um, either curtilage buildings or um, boundary enclosures um, within the application site would fall within the planning process so that the effects of any um, proposals of that type could be properly considered um, by the Council's planning authority through the formal application process. Are you completed? Thank you. Members, obviously a bit question in this. And David McKee, then Katie, and then Jim McComb. Aye, sorry, and Chair. Hey, was that whole green space in the middle, is that what we're talking about? Or has part no. of that been taken away? Sorry, no. Um, the green, the application site is the area of grass just to the south of the area you're talking about and the area of hard standing just to the right-hand side. So go back through the slides. Um, the application site is as shown, um, outlined and hatched in red there. Thanks, Jo. I then had uh, Kate. Thank you, Chair. Um, I was just wondering, do you have a photograph with the outline of the area? Because it's quite, you've shown lots of pictures of the building that's subject to getting taken away, but you also said that that wasn't part of the actual applicant's area that was being discussed today. Do you have a slide that shows on the on a photograph the actual area that we're making our decision on today? Um, it's shown in various sides, but because of the constraints of the site, it's not possible really to get a clear one, you know, showing it as is. But I'll go back through the photographs and just try to um, explain. So here, um, the application site is this area here, and then this area behind the wall. Um, there is a natural um, boundary, if you like, um, of the access track spur that comes along here, um, and then up the side here where the timber post and rail fencing is. And uh, in this slide here, the boundary um, is the, the post, not post, post fence, but the posts that are um, shown there. Does that help clarify? So can I just check the, the half, the semi-constructed building, mm -hmm. is that included in the site or not included? Um, It is. Thank you. I've still quite a few members. I've got uh, Jim McComb, Ian Blake, that's uh, John Young and then Andrew. Thank you, Chair. This, to me, is a very puzzling uh, application. The land in question, as far as I'm aware, was part of the original garden of Craig Lodge. 
and why we should now have an application for it to be recognised as garden ground, I find extremely puzzling. The, it is described here as an area of land of unspecified planning use. I mean, to my mind, it, 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 it's a garden, and, and always was a garden. It's part of what was the original garden, which attaches to Craig Lodge. It is contiguous with the land owned by the applicant who lives in Craig Lodge. It is unusual because this land extends in a sort of horseshoe shape round the property Craig Lodge South. You know, I'm sure you're aware, Chair, there's been a lot of subdivision over the years for this one. Uh, the planning history uh, suggests that. But it is part, it is contiguous to Craig Lodge. I think you maybe had the nail on the head. You don't know whether it's been I don't know whether it's been subdivided in, <laughs> it's, in, 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 it, in it, recent it, times it, or no. It's described as remote from Craig Lodge. I, I'm sure it, David will be able to help you. Yeah. Well, me. I would appreciate if David could please. It is simultaneously a very straightforward and a very complicated application, and I fully accept that. If you look on page 96 and 97, I think that gives you a flavour for just what a complicated planning history, Craig Lodge and its various properties are, it has become so complicated that it appears that this chunk of land is no longer, in planning terms, regarded as being part of the original Craig Lodge. Certainly that was the whole basis on which the reporter looked at the enforcement appeal that we had um, we'd served enforcement notice that went to appeal when the reporter was considering it. The whole issue was, was it or was it not domestic curtilage? Now, there is unfortunately no planning definition of the word curtilage. So there was a lot of debate about all this, and the reporter concluded with us that the land was no longer curtilage, i.e. domestic garden ground. It might be in the ownership of the person who has Craig Lodge, but it wasn't domestic garden ground any longer due to the fragmented planning history. So... That one, I'm afraid you can put to bed because the reporter has come up with a clear view on this, that it wasn't curtilage ground any longer. Therefore, it didn't benefit from permitted development rights. This application, in a sense, is trying to resolve that. We have no problem with this land being formalized or even reformalized as part of the garden ground for Craig Lodge. But in so doing, we don't want to unpick all the issues which are still going on in terms of enforcement. Hence why you've got a recommendation for approval and that condition at the end, which is removing permitted development rights, because otherwise to approve this without that condition would basically sanction what Trace has just shown you on the slides, which is unauthorised and has been through the whole appeal process. I'm sure that helped you, gentlemen. You're content at the moment. If I could just come back uh, briefly, Chair, please. On page 96, it... It mentions here in 1.6, part of the residual land remaining. My understanding is this land always was attached to Craig Road and has never ever been residual land. I think we'll settle with the fact that this is a procedural matter, Jim. I'm no argument with you on what we're trying to determine how to move forward in a way that satisfies both parties or saves maybe a situation like that continuing to, 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 to pose challenges for one or both both parties. I've got Ian Blake, and I've got John Young, Andrew and Katie. Thank you, Chairman. The, the site plan shows the, uh, the application site comes right down to the road boundary. When we look at the aerial view and going on to the site, there appears to be a road to the left, which may or may not service the other properties. If this application was granted to be changed into garden land, would that affect any access to the other properties? David? 
In a word, no, because the legal rights of access, which are a separate issue to planning matters, would still remain. Thanks, Ian. Uh, John Young? No, my question, Chair, would have been exactly the same as Ian Blake's, Council Blake's question. Thank you. Thanks, John. Uh, Andrew? Chair, I'm looking for clarity on why these conditions are being imposed. Is it for punitive reasons, or is it actually because, as I can see from other planning history on the other developments, there's been no conditions subject in their planning? I think it's to prevent that construction remaining because it blocks the view from that particular house. And, and uh, David will help you. Well, yes, that is basically it because what I think paragraph, uh, is it? yeah, paragraph 4.5 sets that out. It's considered necessary in order to ensure that any proposals relating to cartilage buildings and boundary enclosures on the application site would fall within the planning process so that the effects of such developments can be properly considered by the planning authority through the formal application process. So it's not punitive, it's basically to ensure that the amenity of um, Creek Cottage isn't it, the, um, is maintained, because at the moment the, the aspect of that property is adversely affected. Andrew? If I believe so, in my training, we didn't take views, or if you disrupted someone's views, or if you lowered the price or worth of someone's uh, land, that wasn't taken into consideration by planning. David? Indeed, and if you noticed, I used the word aspect rather than view. Hey, I have Katie and then you can cut other. Thank you, Chair. I was just looking for some clarity, really. Um, in terms of this application, the recommendation is approval subject to condition. Can I ask if the application was to be approved without the condition, would that affect the actual, um, would that affect 1.6, the enforcement notice? Are they, does the condition mean that the enforcement notice has to be taken into account if there was no condition would the enforcement notice not apply somehow? I'm just looking for clarity. David? Effectively, approval unconditionally, with no condition that we're recommending here, would unpick all of the work done in the enforcement notice and would authorise the structure that's there. Thank you. Thanks, Katie. Um, Ian Carruthers, and then I. Just going back to one of the points that David mentioned in regards to, I think it was 1.6, where we've had a, a DPA decision. This is, it was quite clear that uh, the land was not part of Craig. It was nearly it's alluded to that the land was not part of uh, Craig as a as a garden area, a meeting area, where, where it should be. And when I read it, it says, that, according to the report, it says that the land did not appear to be land that was used comfortable enjoyment of Craig alone. So, so wasn't it? I didn't think that was absolutely clear cut. I suppose the the point I really need to get to, whether it's here, whether it's in session, maybe this isn't the right place. I wasn't really sure, but. Uh, we've got an application, and I think the only contention on about this application is the restriction of permittable development rights. What we're saying is it's around about the as aspects and the meaning of the, the adjacent dwelling. Uh, how does that apply? To, how, have, do, have we satisfied the five tests when it comes to that condition, those conditions in particular? Is that seen to be reasonable, fair, and so on and so forth? Are we absolutely sure that we've satisfied, satisfied the five tests? Taking it into consideration, any other, any other uh, residential unit within there, they will still have their permittable development rights. So it's almost like one rule for one, one rule for the other. How, how do we, we weigh that up? That's, the, that's what's going through my mind at this moment in time, Chairman. I suppose it'll depend which of the two properties you live in. Eh, David? Removal of permitted development rights by condition is actually a fairly standard thing. It's wherever you consider that there's going, that a development in itself would be acceptable, but there are implications that if you don't remove those rights, it could lead to something which would have an unacceptable level on amenity. I mean, on the inside front cover, you've got the, the six tests for uses of condition uh, set out in Circular 4, 1998. Is it necessary? Well, I consider it is. Is it relevant to planning? It certainly is. Is it relevant to the development to be permitted? Yes. Is it enforceable? Yes. Is it precise? Well, I think it's a very detailed condition. Is it reasonable in other respects? Well, obviously, uh, again, I would refer you to paragraph 4.5, which I think does set out the justification. 
Ian, I'll come back if need be, Ivor. Chair, if that had just been a grassed area and didn't have the offending, in some people's views, uh, building on it, would we have ever considered putting the condition on uh, that we're being asked today? Yes, I think we would, for the simple reason, if you look at that layout, it's very unconventional. You would normally look to have a standard building line where each property has a frontage to a road. Um, this one, if you look at Craig Cottage, it's set further back. So its main aspect, its main view is out to the front. And we would have had concerns for anything going on there. If you notice to the left of Craig Cottage, there's a garage there. Now that, that is a wholly appropriate location to have for a garage. We wouldn't want to see any other buildings going in front of that. It, it's a it's quite a unique situation. I can't think of any other one I've dealt with this in the past, and therefore I think it is appropriate in this, these instances to actually look at the effect on amenity of neighbouring properties. Archie, we're still at questions for officers, of course. Archie, and then Jim. If that's the case here, I'll wait till one sir. Jim. With regard to a permitted development rights, are there dimension limits on what can actually be built? For the garden, it used to be able to check. I don't know, Tracy. Yes, there are. Um, the permitted development legislation has criteria in relation to size of development and positioning of development that would need to be complied with to meet the, um, the requirements. Um, you know, to benefit from permitted development rights. And remember, we're dealing with the circumstances that are presented with us today, or presented as with today. Here, the, the point I'm trying to make is, if this, if this application goes ahead and it is classified as a garden, what is to prevent the owner of the garden planting trees and shrubs? I would presume it would be one of the three A, three B, or three C conditions, David. No, absolutely nothing, um, because basically trees are not development, they're live things. If uh, there was such a, a desire to go and plant a whole load of Lalandi trees along there, nothing we can do about it, but the high hedge notice potentially would then kick in if it was more than two metres in height. Well, that's interesting, but we're not here to speculate, we're here to deal with a, a bit of business. If there, are no other case, if there are no other questions for Tracy, members were in session. Archie? See, I think this would clear a lot of this thing up. I mean, I can remember a couple of uh, applications coming forward for, for this one and just along the roads for this one, which caused all sorts of issues for the, the officers as well. This, is, but this would clear it up. This would make sure that it would be hard and fast issues resolved later on, and, and we have to go with the recommendations on this one, Jim. Okay. Uh, Ivor and then Andrew. Chair, I think um, on the grounds that whether there had been a building or there isn't a building, there would still have been the withdrawal of uh, rights. I think we're right to go with officer recommendation on this. And I'll second Councillor Driver. Thanks, Ivor. Andrew? I was going to ask and propose a motion for a site visit. Okay. There's normally a, 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 a need to explain why you would want one because it's quite clear but anyway i'm happy with that andrew do you want a site visit is there any seconder for a site visit ian suppose we're going to go with a site visit chair any other second so we have a motion from andrew seconded by ian for a site visit with a an amendment by archie seconded by john that we don't Jim McComb, we can't get any debate. We have, a, we have a motion and amendment. Has the motion from Andrew been seconded? Yes, by uh, Ian. Thank you. Confirm that there has been a motion put forward by Councillor Duthie and seconded by Councillor Crothers to go on a site visit in relation to application 8. And an amendment by Councillor Drybra and seconded by Councillor Martin to not go on a site visit and determine the matter today. Councillor Dempster. Amendment. Councillor John Campbell. Amendment. Councillor Blake. Amendment. Councillor Campbell. Amendment. 
Councillor Crothers. Motion. Councillor Dryborough. Amendment. Councillor Ducey. Motion. Councillor Hagman. Amendment. Councillor Hislop. Councillor James. Amendment. Councillor Martin. Amendment. Councillor McComb. Motion. Councillor McKee. Amendment. Councillor Murray. Amendment. Councillor Tate. Amendment. Councillor Young. Amendment. And I can confirm that the amendment carries with 13 votes to 3, and the matter will be determined today. Thanks, Lucy. We're back to the situation we are actually as proposed. We go with the officer recommendation. Are there any alternative proposals? In that case, it's unanimous, a unanimous decision. Can you de inform the committee of the decision, please, Lucy? And the committee have decided to approve the application subject to condition. Thanks, Lucy. Thanks, Tracy. Agenda item nine, request for authorisation to take direct action under section 179 of the Town and Country Planning Scotland Act 1997 on untidy land at 31 Esk Road, Gretna. Uh, which officer is doing this? You, David. David will take us through his presentation. Thank you, Chair. It's not very often that we actually bring enforcement matters before the committee, but it's one of the few things that uh, delegated powers do not cover for enforcement is where we get to the stage of needing direct action. Uh, Section 179 notices are commonly known as untidy land notices. They're not something to be used uh, regularly, to be honest, because the, there's a whole lot of implications and rights of appeal, etc. But with this one, there was a number of parties expressed grave concern about the property here, as you can see, is a, a terrace property where it's an absentee landlord who lives down in Peterborough, and it has become an absolute eyesore with potential threats for fire risk, health risk, etc. So overall, it's one that we feel it is an exceptional case and does justify um, taking direct action. We served a notice, that came into play, and the, there was no action taken. There's no possibility of going to the procurator fiscal with these notices, which is another reason to use them sparingly, uh, which leaves us with the only option of direct action. And in this instance, we think it is justified and we would go through the normal uh, procedures for debt recovery to try and uh, get the money back on this. But it is one which I think is justified in this case. Same procedures as question for officers first and then in session. Are there any questions for the case of Officer Ray Iver? Chair, the report sort of suggests that it's under a thousand pounds to tidy this up. What could the cost be of actually chasing that thousand pounds from the guy in Peterborough? Um, are we going to cost ourselves two or three thousand pounds by just rather than going in and act? I know I would rather see the money uh, returned to us, but are we actually going to end up costing ourselves more by chasing this rather than just tidying it up and moving on? David? The council does have debt recovery procedures, so there are methods in place. I mean, ultimately, it would, I suspect, never been involved in this side of things, but uh, as I understand it, there will be a point at which it's written off as a bad debt. It's not worth pursuing much further. But certainly in the first instance, we would want to try and uh, obtain that back through all the proper methods. Just in case it fills up again, the full in week, Iva. Uh, are there any other questions for the case officer? Sure. Could could we take over the property and sell it to recover the amount that we have incurred, the expense that we have incurred, and give the changes to the owner? Might pick up mere debt with the state <laughs> of the property, but anyway, David. Honest answer, no idea. Uh, that's something which the debt recovery team would look into, I presume. It used to be that we couldn't, we 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 could try and recoup it, but we couldn't take a a. a condition on a property as a means of recruiting debt. If there are any other questions for the case officer, we're in session, Archie. Chair, this has been ongoing for several years now. Um, next door neighbour uh, phoned me uh, just before Christmas where there was a fire next door. Uh, they've been actually stealing the inside 
copper wiring and that off that particular house and selling it to the scrap yards and that type of thing. I know that uh, other um, elected members have also had, had uh, representations in this particular thing. We have tried getting community safety in. We know where the person stays. The police have been involved, so therefore they know exactly where the person stays. So I think the recovery would be quite easily of, of the, the amount. This is uh, an alarming site, and, and, and obviously the guy next door had a stroke because of this. I'm not saying it was because of that, but certainly the stress wouldn't have helped the matter with, with issues such as fire. So I'm going to go with the recommendations in this one, Chair. It's, it's just something that needs to be done. Yeah, so Elaine. I'd like to concur with Archie's points. I was involved with this property in a previous post um, and try, attempted to pursue the owner uh, to get action done. It was an absolute disgrace. The place is an absolute eyesore. Uh, it was encouraging dumping from other people and very unpleasant for the neighbours. And I'm really pleased that at last that the council is taking action. I wish they'd taken action some years ago, but I'm glad that at last that we're taking action on this. Thanks for that, Elaine. Any alternative view? In that case, it's a unanimous decision. Can you confirm the decision? Correct me, please, Lucy. And I confirm that members have agreed to authorise direct action powers for officers of the Council to carry out the work specified in paragraph 1.3 of the report with immediate effect. Thank you very much for your attendance today, members. I have no more business. Thank you indeed.